All right, great. Okay, so I am going to call this meeting to order and get Patty back in her seat. And this is the June 18th regular council meeting. And uh, I guess we still have a uh, deputy clerk. So, Patty, if you'd like to call the roll, please. Sure. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yeah, here. Hampling? Here. Stokes? Here. Krieger? Here. Okay, good. So, um, actually, first on our agenda, I think we uh, have a swearing in. So, all right. That's what that guy's here. Yes. <laughs> That's See? what I wondered, right. too. Okay, well, yeah, let it in the cool. All right, good. So, um, all right, and we'll, we'll do them together. All right, so if you want to raise your right hand and uh, repeat after me. I solemnly affirm. I solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution and will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States and the state of Ohio. And the state of Ohio. And I will, in all respects. And I will, in all respects, observe the provisions of the charter. Observe the provisions of the charter and the ordinance of the villages, uh, the ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, the ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, and will faithfully discharge the duties of, and will faithfully discharge the duties of the offices of the offices of right. or the zoning appeals alternate and library commission. Great. All right. Thank you, our official. Thank you, Mr. Zoff. Thank you. All right. Congratulations. We <laughs> won't tell anybody that I've been on the Library Commission for a while. <laughs> okay. So, I'm sorry, BZA Alternate and Library Commission, right? Correct. That's right. All right. And so with that, um, do we have any announcements? I don't have the details of it, but I just wanted to let people know that on Sunday, um, there is a demonstration in Springfield about the um, separating of children from their families at the border, mm. parents at the border. So people might want to look out for that information. Mm. All right. Thanks and, for and that. And I guess there may be a gay pride march on Saturday. Okay. Well, so we know that uh, June 30th Saturday. will be, yeah, will be YS Pride. All right. Oh. Well, a week from this Saturday. Yeah, yep. we know that. We know that for sure. Oh, good. We know it's going to be from 12 to 5, and uh, we don't yet have the details on the parade and all that. So, yeah. So. Oh, well. well, on that same Saturday, uh, Blacks and Yellow Springs tours will have the second part of their faith walking tours. They had the first part, Faith Part 1, on May 19th. So on June 30th will be Faith Part 2. They'll be starting at First Baptist at 1 p.m. Great. Great. All right. Uh, anything else? Um, so I do want to highlight a few other things. Um, so a big deal for us is June 27th uh, is going to be uh, kind of a, a dual, uh, uh, two events. First of all, at 6 o'clock, we're going to be doing the ribbon cutting for the Bike Sickle Friendly Community uh, Award that Yellow Springs received. And um, we're going to have the uh, police department out there with the hot, hot dog cart. And uh, we'll also probably have some freezy pops because I'm sure it's going to be hot. So, uh, so we'll have a little party from 6 to 7. At, the, I'm sorry, and ahead. that's at the Yellow Springs Station. Um, and then the other big part, and uh, there will be poster boards up at that event, and we'll bring people down at 7 o'clock for the unveiling of the draft active transportation plan. So that's, uh, we've been talking about that for, I guess, four months now. Unveiling. Unveiling, yes. Yes, that's right. We're going to have curtains on every poster, and it uh, should be pretty exciting. That is still an opportunity for community feedback. It's a draft active transportation plan. And so um, this is where we'll see maps of the recommended routes. And the most important thing about coming is that we have the opportunity to flag three projects that they will preliminary engineer. So they will basically tee those up for grant requests. So this is an opportunity, I guess the last opportunity really for citizens to come and weigh in on what they think are the, the most important uh, streets and sidewalks to pay attention to. 
So I will tell you that I know Dayton Street is getting a lot of attention, the schools and completing the Safe Routes to School project. Um, and there are a variety of other things, certainly our downtown. Um, but that's gonna be a fun event. So six to seven at the Yellow Spring Station, seven to eight thirty mm -hmm. in rooms A and B. Oh, seven to eight thirty. Yes. Unveiling. Yes. There'll be two unveilings. Two. Yes. Well, because the other one is bike friendly community. Yeah. Um, and then, um, Patty, do you want to tell us about July fourth fireworks so people can start preparing? Uh, we have the the regular. Um, application for the July 4th fireworks. Uh, they will be, I believe, at 10 o'clock on that evening. There is no rain date. So okay. they'll be in the regular place down there at Gaunt Park. And you can watch them from your normal spot around town. I can see quite a bit of them from my back porch. So All right. that's where I usually it's, hang out. So is that an invitation? <laughs> if you would like. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, Mary Ann asked about the parade. Uh, I don't have the details on the parade yet, unfortunately. I can uh, text the chief and ask him if he would like, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's right. the, it hasn't come before. Only real Yellow Springs event. Yeah, <laughs> nice. All right. So are the Hawaiian shirt uh, contingent going to be out there in the parade? Well, I think I'll see what I can do. About All right, good. I'd like to join. Um, two other quick things. Uh, one of our tenants, Stony Creek, who's just right on 68, is going to host the um, Chamber Business After Hours. If you have not been out there to see what they have done over the last couple of years, it's amazing. Um, that's going to be this Thursday, uh, uh, I think that's the 21st from 5.30 to 7.30. And um, the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, the Michael Schumann visit. Uh, if council's not all familiar with Michael Schumann, uh, I will just say he is the guru of local investing. And I would strongly recommend um, if you are able uh, on Thursday, June 28th, to see what the results of his visit are. Uh, we're gonna be, I think, in this room um, from 8.30 to 11.30. Uh, there'll be coffee and pastries, since we're gonna be here for a couple hours. And he is going to talk about um, his interactions with the village, with uh, the, the schools, with our nonprofits, with our local business folks, uh, and give some of his uh, highlights of what he thinks our opportunities are uh, for local investing. And I'm sorry, that's what time, Brian? Uh, 830 to 1130. So he's going to actually be here from the 26th to the 28th. Uh, but June 28th is the day to really kind of hear what he has absorbed it, it, and what he thinks uh, it, makes sense. And that's AM or PM? AM. Okay, great. All right, so next up we have the, oh, something we else? We have our clock. Yes, you have a clock. <laughs> Thank you. You're Did welcome. you want to make an announcement about that? No, I, uh, you know, I looked over and I started to look and I thought, oh, there's no clock. And then I saw there was a clock. Nice. All right. Keeping us on time and perfect for the consent agenda, right on time. Um, so we have two things on the consent agenda. We have the minutes from our Mar uh, sorry, our May 21st meeting, as well as for our June 4th meeting. And uh, I will in entertain a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Great. All right, review of the agenda. Um, anything that we would like to change, add, et cetera. Uh, I just have a comment. I think the conversation about the Community Improvement Corporation, I don't know, I, I think I was thinking it might be more than 15 minutes, so. Just okay. I'll and I think, we, I think we should have time, so okay. yeah, we've got a little extra time. Um, anything else? Judith, there, there wasn't something else you wanted to Oh, um, I, I can just do it during my report, I get. Well, why don't we put it on all business uh, on the JSTF, yeah. I'll do that. So what? It's just, it's just um, basically getting the AOK, -okay, which I think council's already aware of that JSTF, you know, it's coming to the end of its life, but um, 
Lisa and I were going to recommend that it go till the end of the year as we're developing uh, a, a recommendation about what would happen after that. So okay. that's what it is. It's, there's nothing. Okay. And then, Patty, am I correct? This did not end up in the packet. It did not end up in the packet. Okay. What so, did not? It ended, um, it ended up in my folder. Uh, <laughs> this is a request for from the Tecumseh Land Trust to sponsor um, their event, but. Uh, it's not until the fall, so I'm just going to propose that we wait until the next meeting so we have it in the packet. Mm -hmm. So we need to put that under new business in the packet? Yeah. Okay. So uh, if nothing else, then uh, Marianne, why don't you tell us about our petitions and communications? Yes, we had two. One was a notice that Prostate Cancer Awareness Month is September. So perhaps we would get more information in September. And the other was a letter from Henry Myers requesting that any village land that was sold through the designated Community Improvement Corporation be approved of by the village council. Okay. And we can, when we get to that topic, we can provide more context uh, under the two concerns that were brought up um, that because Lisa and I were both in that meeting. So great. All right. Um, so let's move on to uh, legislation. And uh, the first thing we have on the agenda is Ordinance 2018-25, Small Cell Towers. Um, Patty, I guess let's read that in full. Sorry. No problem. I am using Judy's computer and it doesn't, it's not a touch screen like mine, so it might take me a minute. Uh, no, I'll just pull it up here. Okay. An ordinance repealing Chapter 876 wireless services of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting a new Chapter 876 small cell facilities and wireless support structures. Whereas the codified ordinances for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio established general procedures and standards for wireless facilities and support structures. And whereas the Ohio House Bill 478 of the 132nd General Assembly, House Bill 478, has been enacted and will become effective August 1st, 2018. And whereas House Bill 478 affects the codified ordinances for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, as it relates to wireless facilities and support structures, the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby, hereby ordains that. Section one, chapter, that chapter 876 entire, entitled Wireless Services of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be repealed in its entirety, including all sections therein. Section two, that a new chapter 876 entitled Small Cell Facilities and Wireless Support Structures of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be enacted to read as set forth on Exhibit A, which is attached hereto and incorporated herein with the new language underlined and bolded and deleted language in strike through. Section three, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Okay, thanks, Patty. Mm -hmm. I'll entertain a motion to approve. I move that we approve. Second. Okay, uh, Chris, do you wanna walk us through this? Well, yes, I mean, thank you, Brian. The solicitor's report kind of summarizes where we've been. I know that council, and, and this is not the first council that's uh, to deal with this because it's been going on now for well over a year and a half. Um, Originally, there was a uh, lawsuit brought by a number of municipalities regarding the fact that the legislation as originally proposed and passed by uh, Columbus or in Columbus uh, essentially removed virtually all local control to the placement of what people are referring to as mini cell towers. Uh, the solicitor's report indicates what that is uh, and with hopes of getting up to five gigs of data speed. We were not, we made a decision not to participate in that uh, litigation because we felt that we could piggyback on the outcome without having to uh, utilize village resources. I might add that when it went, came up with House Bill 5, which was the, uh, the income tax issue, Rita took that up and that was not an additional expense to the village either in that case. So in terms of uh, avoiding the cost of litigation, we've been successful in doing that and then getting the benefits of the outcome of the litigation. So now back to mini cell towers. This is the, the byproduct of um, a local a group of municipalities 
uh, getting together. The city of Kettering uh, had volunteered to take the lead and create a template. Uh, we also reviewed the city of Dublin. Um, Jennifer Gruy did the, uh, the, the bulk of the drafting uh, with significant input from Denise, uh, Patty, and uh, with Johnny. And uh, I think that we're, we've got what we need in here. Uh, we've done our best to protect the control of design specifications and to maintain as much control as we can. The key thing to keep in mind from uh, the perspective of revenue is that uh, when companies come in and want to put up these mini cell towers, we're not going to make any money to speak up from it. That was part of the issue. Um, Nine dollars and forty-three cents per, per attachment. No. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It, you know, in a typical situation, uh, and this is a source of contention with all the municipalities. One would expect, since it's our infrastructure, that if they're going to piggyback on that that they should be paying something more than what they are. Uh, and that was a battle that was fought and we were not successful as a whole throughout the state with all the municipalities. Um, so essentially it came down to a belief that we, you know, we'll take what we can get. Bottom line is we have this done. The law takes effect August 1st. We just want to make sure that this is passed before the August 1st enact, official enactment date uh, because once the governor signs it, there's a period of time. We're going to go back through it between now and the next council meeting to make sure that we have touched all the bases that we want. There may be modest changes when it's presented again, but they will not be substantive in nature. And then the last thing that we're doing is we're going back through our zoning and planning code to make sure that there's no unintended consequences of this to make sure that we capture what we need to. So it is possible that at our next meeting there may be some emergency type legislation we may need for housekeeping purposes as it fits into our comprehensive codes. Um, right now we're not sure about that, but uh, we're having an internal discussion about conditional use aspects of it to make sure that we can keep the control that we want, but we'll give council a heads up on that well in advance. Okay. Um, any, yeah, uh, yeah. Mary, I had a few questions on, uh, let's see, S, S, oh, under definitions, S, where it says all wireless equipment associated with the facility is cumulatively not more than 28 cubic feet in volume. Oh, I guess. The main thing, my question is, what do these things look like? Do you know? Small. Well, certainly. Cubic feet. I can get some Not pictures, small. some examples uh, that I can mm -hmm. get to you. It depends. Um, and the, the information we were presented with uh, almost a year ago, that was a big concern that municipalities had, particularly with areas that had historical districts or commercial districts that, that were they had trying to maintain some architectural integrity. Um, I don't have a good answer for you on that. I, you'd have to see the pictures. Yeah, I think it would be good to see some pictures. Although you described, was it not in your memo somewhere, that for the most part these are just <clears throat> small devices to bounce the signal, right? Correct. I mean, I, I think as I, and I'm working from a memory here because some of this, the technical side is not within my, my skill set. But I recall that Johnny indicated that, uh, or maybe Patty, you did, but there was a concern that with, given the weight of some of these mini cells that we had to have poles of a certain, uh, certain specifications that would support the devices. Does that ring a bell? Yes, and, and in addition to that, the other concern with the size of the device was that they are of such a size that if they put them on our electric poles, the original bill said that we, if we had a power outage, we couldn't repair our own poles. We had to wait for them. And that was one of the reasons that municipalities fought it so hard, was because we have to have access to our own poles. Mm -hmm. um, so now we don't have to let them attach to electric poles. But I mean, I think we're talking about something, you know, like that. They're, I'm guessing three by three, maybe. Right. Right. But, yeah. Well, okay. And so you just brought this up, but I thought I read somewhere that municipal 
utilities are exempted from this. Did I imagine reading that or? We, I think we're exempted from it, but we still have to approve the right of way permits. We can't, okay. they, we don't have to let them attach to our poles. Right. But we, that is not a means to deny them a permit to put in their own pole. Uh, okay, interesting. Which is why we put the aesthetic and, and the, um, the some design specifications. design specifications. That's why we had to work on that. So are we assuming they're putting in their own poles or they're going to attach to ours or both? Or, and both. As well as it, under the, it, oh. the, the, actual, the actual devices themselves will, will probably be on their own poles while the lines running between oh. actual devices, if necessary, oh. would be attached to ours, at which point oh. the pole attachment agreement would come I into see. effect. Okay. okay. What does T-O-L-L -L mean? Is that in the definition? Talks about it's something, something may be told. I actually read this one. I did too. I, I read it and I wasn't entirely sure what she meant by it. So we don't know what told. Well, that, I read it, but I'm not sure I would know off the top of my head. Okay. Does it matter that what, it. What page is it on, Miriam? Yeah. The well, these aren't numbered, so it's hard right. to say oh. what page it's on. It's uh, section. Section 8. Six seven point zero oh four point four under decisions um, C or D E eight seventy six. You said eight six seven. It's eight seven six. Eight seven six dot zero oh four dot four decisions E. The time period required in subsection B above may be told only by. And I saw that word a couple other. I, th I thought maybe it was a mistake, but I saw it. Let's see here. Yeah. Well, it must mean period of time that something has to happen or doesn't have to happen. Or something. Okay. So the next thing, does it matter that this document refers to Yellow Springs as a city rather than a village? We, we had a discussion about that because um, the, uh, and if that's in there, it should be municipality in our code. Apparently we use village and municipality because of various iterations and drafting. I would prefer use of the word village, but if it says city, we need to clean that up. It should yep. not say city. And that's, well, again, no page numbers, so it's under standards 876.05.1 general um, Q taxes Tax and assessments. assessments. Yep. I should say village. And then the last, in that same, oh no, no, it's. Eight, the next 876.05.2, design and siting requirements. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it jumps to nine. Mm -hmm. So I wonder. Yeah, it goes from the sixth to about. the ninth, the priorities. Like either it shouldn't be nine or eight and seven, or eight is missing. We'll, we'll fix that uh, sometimes when you, you do the red lines and the underlines, it, it affects the pagination. Unless where it says one, maybe that's eight. Well, I don't think so. No. It, it, I, I think that that's yeah, it's got to be a mistake just, to be corrected. Yeah, it just needs to be the seventh. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I want to go back to, um, so if, if we don't have to allow them to attach to our municipal poles, are we allowed to set up lease agreements if they determine that that's their best option? The, Do their own pole? The, the pole attachment agreement, which I think in there is just called attachment agreement or attachment certificate, um, the pole attachment agreement is where we allow them to put them on our poles. So if, that's if that's so the choose. limit. If we allow them, that's the limit as to what we can charge. It's what we charge everyone else who has a pole attachment agreement with us. Now, that's not that's not a permit. There's right. a permit fee 
okay, which is one of the things we're going to be bringing back that's going to need to be changed is the permit schedule because there's no permit fee for this. Well, right. Well, we established it at 200, right? Um, yes, but it still has to go onto the permit fee. Sure. And but I guess what I'm wondering is if, if we decide we don't want to allow them to attach, can we go back to the old way of how we've done it? Or um, does this legislation limit us from negotiating? It, I don't think it limits us from negotiating. I think the question is there would be a, so many instances that we may not want to do that. I think it would, we'd have to be very specific, just like we are with AT&T and bp &L and everybody else that we let use our polls. Okay. Time Warner. Um, all right, so I had a couple other questions. Uh, so in the past legislation that's black lined out, <clears throat> there are references to these decisions coming to council um, related to, you know, especially I would think like things that would have a bigger impact. And so I guess I'm wondering with this rewrite, why planning commission or council is not contemplated into any of these decisions. Are you saying in terms of the approval process yes. or this le the, the approval of this actual legislation? When we, yeah, when, no, no. I, I'm talking about when we like make decisions that presumably could have impacts on the you know character of the village. Why these determinations? Everything now is the village manager decides. So I'm wondering why planning commission or village council is not in the mix. And if you look at some of what's been crossed out, village council was contemplated in some of these decisions. And, and part of the discussion was, should this be permitted use or conditional use? Mm -hmm. And the concern was that if it was a conditional use, you know, how many of them would we have and would it tie up the planning commission and that type of thing? Um, and do you guys anticipate a mad rush of these or? It's already started. Okay. <laughs> Trying to get ahead of the to get ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the concerns that we had um, when we did it the way we did it. And there was a discussion about <clears throat> should it be a conditional use or should it be a permitted use. Mm -hmm. So, and as Chris said, we're still kind of hashing out those details. So it's good that we can have this, this input. And it, the concern is very much about the aesthetic character. We, right. we, we being mostly Johnny and Denise, admittedly, came up with specific areas that should be excluded from like the downtown business area as far as the interior of the business area it can be done in the alleyways and serve the purpose just as well. So we are allowed to limit those kind of things so that it doesn't affect our aesthetic character. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that we've been looking at. So the design standards. Okay, well, so I guess I want to put that out there. Um, you know, we've talked, it, the legislation talks about three levels and that first level of just sort of like, you know, whatever, replacing an existing structure. Mm -hmm. I'm not concerned about that. I guess what I am concerned about with are the other two that seems substantively, you know, that they could have some impact. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know. Well, and, and there was there was consideration, and, and I'll be honest, by the time Chris got this to me on Friday, I didn't have a chance to <clears> read it fully, but there was discussion, and Chris, you can say if this is in there, maybe, um, of if Denise had a concern about the effect that it would have on the neighborhood, could she, she then direct that it go to planning commission? Mm -hmm. And that, that was what we wanted to do. Right. Uh, I'm not sure how Jennifer worded it in the in the actual ordinance. Okay, yeah, well right now, you know, village manager decides <clears throat> and, and then that's kind of it. Um, so I guess one thing I get a little bit concerned about is, I mean, if we're thinking about uh, municipal broadband or we're thinking about some other project that it, it, it may make sense to have some additional, you know, checks uh, you know, on some of these decisions. Uh, and, and so, so, I don't know. So are you saying that you'd like to maybe consider it being a conditional use that would require a planning hearing? Possibly. I mean, I guess I'd also, I would encourage looking back at the original way that this legislation was structured. 
because there's one whole section that talks about council's decisions on these things and, and so I guess I just wondered what you know if this was driven by the state or you know why we were what process we were setting up so it, it, and I'm just asking to be clear so that I take the right right message back are you talking about Planning Commission having the oversight council having the oversight or both in some way and one of the things to keep in mind is that under our existing code that an appeal from the Planning Commission is only on the process right. that Planning Commission used right. so functionally Council could not make any substantive decision to reverse what Planning Commission has done mm -hmm. um, well personally my opinion is I think that any of these more major uh, uh, small cell towers or whatever should have a council review I mean, we, we until could... until it becomes until we determine it's becoming burdensome but I saw that we you know we're giving 180 days for the the third category which has the most impact we're giving 90 days so I mean there is time for it to you know be passed by us and not slow down that process so I, I would ask a question. So Chris, I, I know you use the Kettering and some other template, Kettering in particular, um, to sort of merge the existing uh, writing to more match, I guess, what they did. Is that perhaps how some of what Brian's asking about got moved because Kettering's template didn't have council weighing in as much? I can't answer that question specifically. What I can say is, is that the, the, the relevant piece of this is when we went back to our codes and looked at conditional use, looked at whether or not there were rights of appeal, and th 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 we're getting really into the weeds here, but there is, there is a piece that, that, of, that we had to look into as to whether or not we can even rely on our zoning code to do any of this mm -hmm. and so when we were having this discussion late last week um, we factored that in and, and where we came out was that we felt that it could potentially be a burden to planning commission it's the program was designed so that Denise would design standards in place as the zoning administrator functionally the village managers designee would be the most logical place to put that control in um, I know I'm not answering your question directly, but we did do our best to try and tailor it to the needs of the village and the existing code that we have. It, and I do want to point out, and Brian, I fully understand what you're saying about making sure that these things fit aesthetically because we don't have any idea what they're going to look like or what kind of site plan they're going to present to us. But I will point out that we do have the Planning Commission that is generally the board that would oversee this kind of thing as a part of the comprehensive land use plan and, and mm -hmm. the zoning code and that. So I think that while I understand what you're saying and, and maybe we do need to add some more oversight, I think we need to be careful about council stepping into the Planning Commission role because they're supposed to be kind of this separate quasi-judicial body um, and right, I, and but recognizing the planning commission's not contemplated here either. Right, right. Um, so maybe that's what's added in here. If you make it a conditional use, then it then it goes to planning commission, and then if council wants to see them, that you know that's fine. But I'm, I think that maybe we want to be kind of careful about overriding. When was this legislation the the prior? I mean, I guess what we have on the books now. When was this? Developed, passed. I didn't see a date. Are you on it. the existing right of way? Yeah. Well, just all of this, because there's a lot of stuff in here that's the recent codified, the current codified. Yeah, it's. I mean, if you look at what was uh, taken out, mm -hmm. it's a, a. It was clear to me that whoever put this legislation together, whatever council was thinking, you know, very carefully about how these decisions were made. I, we've had poll attachment agreements that 
are actually almost older than me, mm -hmm. honestly. And um, <laughs> so I don't know when this would have last been updated um, because most of this has to do with pull attachment agreements and with other than cell companies. Well, is this a pretty big concern for you? I mean, I, I guess I'm going to suggest if it is, maybe we should, well, we can table it and you work. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, this is just our first reading. So, yeah, I mean, I think they, my indication is that there seems to be a big policy change here mm -hmm. that I don't want us to ignore. And, and it's, it, and it occurs to me it's not just driven by the state. I mean, you know, one mm -hmm. thing is that we have to comply, I understand that, but um, yeah, it comes back to this process. What would you the, the code um, indicates that this was done in 2000. 2000? Yeah. Okay. Um, that we come prepared for a discussion about whether this is something that we're willing to abdicate to the village manager or planning commission, or if this is important enough that we should see these things. Um, and again, I don't imagine that it would be that burdensome, honestly. I mean, most of them are probably just like a little thing that they're sticking on a light pole and we say fine. But I would be concerned if we had a big initiative like municipal broadband that this would get in the way of, um, that you know, we would want to flag that. So what, what do you recommend we do tonight? Um, I don't, well, I'm not recommending that we vote on it. I mean, I think we've had the discussion Okay, the only thing I'm going to say is, if you'll notice in Chris's report, um, the August 1st, 2018 um, is when the, the House bill goes into effect. And we really need our legislation to be in effect before then. So, it can be passed as an emergency, Chris. It could. What I'm thinking is, is that you've raised a number of issues, of questions that we need to get answers for, mm -hmm. including some photographs of what these things look like. Um, we can get that this week, and um, and that may or may need, may not lead to you know, substantive changes. I think fundamentally the legislation is going to appear to be essentially what you see today. Um, yeah, and, and so to me, I, the only thing, the really, the only thing is this process piece. Right. So our process. So I, I, my suggestion would be, a recommendation would be, is let's get it to the second reading, and mm -hmm. we can get answers to those specific questions because they've been raised in the meeting today. Okay. Um, go ahead. I have something. Else. No, I'm, I'm good. And, and then, so I, I, I here are my, the questions that I have, so that we're clear. Um, Brian, you've asked whether or not we can negotiate a different rate if it's a, if it's a uh, if it's one of our polls, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the question of where should a review process properly vest for purposes of maintaining the control of the standards that the village wants to maintain? Is it adequate to have it through the village manager as designee? Should we consider planning commission? Should we consider council directly? And we've had those discussions, but we'll provide a report to you on that. Uh, and then, um, let's see, uh, then my last point is, is that what impact, if any, would there be if we, the village determined to move forward with a broadband initiative uh, and how that could be impacted by the existence of these many towers on poles? Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so I think uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, but yeah, I, again, I would really encourage council to read what is being taken out because that was very informative to me. I didn't read that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. You're, I mean, you're right, Brian. I, like Mary said, I, did, I focused on what was there and not what was pulled out. And you're right, council is all throughout what was pulled out. Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Um, okay, so let's move on. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can we just back up? The yes. chief has the chief has texted me that he has no details on the parade yet. Oh, okay. Okay. So. okay. All right, Patty. So let's uh, read in Ordinance 2018-26 in full, please. So we're not voting on this. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not going to call a vote on that. Okay. An ordinance, ordinance modifying section 1042.01 for giving first delayed electric service payment charge each calendar year. Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs provide, provides electric utilities to all residents and businesses 
eligible for said services within the village and whereas the village of Yellow Springs is committed to a service oriented non punitive relationship with the community and whereas it is recognized that a delayed electric service payment may be due to an oversight or other factors now therefore the council of the village for the village of Yellow Springs Ohio here what hereby ordains that section one a modification of section 1042.01 electric service charges of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs Ohio is hereby enacted to read as set forth in Exhibit A, which is hereto attached and incorporated herein by reference. Section 2, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Okay, thanks, Patty. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, sorry, was that Lisa or Judith first? Judith okay. and Kevin. Uh, Lisa. Yes, um, this is the first of what... Um, I think we're thinking of as a portfolio of action related to utility affordability. Um, I want to acknowledge that by bringing this ordinance, we are not solving the problem of utility affordability in the village by any means, but it is a first step that um, we're hoping is helpful. There's a variety of reasons why people may have a delayed electric service payment, um, and we hope that this is a helpful action. Um, some of the other elements of a portfolio that I think people can anticipate just to give a sense of what else is underway um, is a have recently um, a specific audit on the utilities for that reason because folks were saying that their audits were uh, or their bills were inaccurate so we did have that special audit um, just last year that said everything was as it should be and so but I'm, we're happy to look at it again yeah, so um, this seems to be more recent than that more related to when the rates changed so I think we should, I mean, just because it's such a, a hot issue in the community, I, I think we, we need to talk about it. And I do encourage anyone who thinks that their bill is not correct to please contact the office so that we can look at it. If we can't look at your bill and don't understand where you think it's um, incorrect, we can't correct it if it's wrong or help you understand why it is correct, which is our goal is to help you understand or fix whatever error we made. Um, the other thing I'm going to point out is, um, and, and the issue with the, with the late fee is that all three of the different utilities are in different sections of ordinance, and so it's my belief that the, the manager's finance committee wanted this to be on all three because it's a combined bill, mm -hmm. which means we need to pass two more ordinances. Okay, so um, we need that we'll need to add those. And um, because this is only on electric, because electric is separate from water, is separate from sewer. Um, the, the garbage is kind of is what it is. It's in and out. Um, but we need to at least pass the other two because it's combined bill. So in other words, we can't just pass one about the, the billing format, the bill late fee. We have to separate out to yes. three ordinances. Because all three of them have the same late fee attached. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That was the only comments that I wanted to make. So last time when we talked about this, uh, my understanding was that our software, at least at that point, did not allow it. It was going to be very cumbersome for, for staff. I suggested, how about if we just say, if people want that forgiven, they come into the office. Mm -hmm. So where does this stand? 
Um, that's written into the ordinance. Written into it. They have to request. But, but yeah, but it's part of the procedure. Okay. And that's in here, I can... Written yeah. request. It, will that look, uh, look at the first page of the ordinance okay. under the charge? Oh, okay. A small, it's kind okay. of hard, hard right. Thank you. ordinance to follow this under five. So my question was, I didn't understand why rate number two had this waiver as well. Because the way I read rate number two is that that's not residential. And that's probably a mistake. Okay. Um, if we had a discussion, then uh, the paralegal who drafted this for me, I approved the language. We had specific discussions that it was for residential only. And I think that that was a mistake. Okay, because it's left off of rate three and four. And I also wanted to confirm that it was that, that this forgiveness uh, is only for the residential piece. That's right. correct. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Catch yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. okay um, I guess to me this is sort of a courtesy. It's not significant. Mm -hmm. Right. But you know what it looks that saying, you know, death by a million cuts. <laughs> you know, I mean it, it may not be that much money, but you know, you have all of these little it's sort of yeah, a goodwill. To me it's a goodwill gesture. It's yeah. Not, it's a, I mean. Right. Well I think the other thing is it's moving us forward on I mean we, we are starting to take action on affordability. And so I mean definitely right, it's it's minor, but I mean, the under, there's there's much more underlying issues about why utility bills are high that even have to do with what people are able to do to insulate their homes. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, I mean, this is really the first of a portfolio of things that try to get more at a root cause, but that takes a little longer. Thanks. All right, cool. Uh, if there's nothing else, uh, Patty, would you call the roll, please? Uh, sure. Headplane? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Out. Yes. Okay, uh, so let's turn to resolution 2018-22, uh, and Patty can read that in my title only. Authorizing the village manager to issue a request for proposals for the electric pole replacement project. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve. I move. Okay, um, so we talked about this at the last meeting, um, and uh, actually, no. This, I mean, we did talk about this, but uh, Patty, why don't you explain what, what's different about this resolution? Uh, the, this resolution um, is for the, to get proposals to replace the approximately 90 electric poles that cannot be replaced by the in-house staff. And I would have included this 58-page <laughs> bid packet if you really wanted to see it, but I didn't think that you really wanted to see it. <laughs> This 58 page bid packet. So um, this will go out, and it, it, if you recall, when we approved the contract for high tech to replace, um, I think it was 11 poles for $49,000, there was a discussion that I asked Johnny to bring up about could we get a better price if we get a larger quantity? And this is in response to that, that conversation that we had, which we can get a better price probably if we do a larger quantity. So we need to see what it's going to cost to do the whole shebang. Um, it's being put out as a lump sum bid, which means they're going to give us one number to do everything that needs to be done for those polls. Great. All right. Questions or comments? Yes. Um, I didn't think about municipal fiber in the small cell tower discussion, so Brian, I'm glad you brought that up. But I did have a question about municipal fiber and other things with respect to the replacement of poles. I don't know poles other than they used to be trees, um, but um, I'm just wondering, so I am interested in the bid packet. Uh, if, um, if those types of considerations are, are being made, you know, we have the date once policy, and so I'm just trying to be forward thinking, um, you know, like what is the high tech or, you know, moderate tech way to move forward so that uh, we're future proofing 
uh, our, ourselves as we move forward. The, the, the primary concern with electric poles is that everything has to be separated by a certain amount of space. Mm -hmm. So you have a three phase, and you have a single phase, and you have a cable line, and you have a telephone line. Everything has to be separated by a certain amount of space. And I think it's generally three feet. So as long as your pole is tall enough, um, you can attach a lot of things to it. Poles are generally the same height um, when they're interior in the village. They may be a little bit higher if they're out in the country. Um, so the answer to your question is I can't answer your question definitively. Um, if there's room on the pole, then there shouldn't be a problem. So, and, and a pole doesn't necessarily have all of those things on it. It could have just a three-day one or just a single-day one. Right. Well, again, I just want to think about these things as we move right. forward. Um, so, you know, I, I am of the belief that municipal broadband is, a, is, an, is an inevitability. Um, so we should be thinking about it, you know, whether it's on, ends up on poles or underground or wherever it ends up that we are making considerations as we're modifying and planning infrastructure. Now. Yeah, and, and, and when the broadband uh, discussion first came up, Kevin, um, that was one of the considerations that we talked about and, and the concern was more the condition of the poles and the need to have them in place and their accessibility mm -hmm. in a lot of a lot of instances, not necessarily about whether they could have been added. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the, on that line of thought, I remember that a lot of the inaccessible, well, the inaccessible poles were in the house. Mm -hmm. So are are these, uh, some of these poles going to be in alleys and is the, they, they're going to be the they'll be all, yeah. cutting down of the they're, they're going to be. They're, they're going to be all over the village. They're going to be in backyards. They're going to be in alleyways. Some of them are going to be just ones that we don't have the safety, proper safety equipment to do. Um, so some of them will be yes in alleyways, and the brush will get cut to replace them. Because one of the broadband considerations was the, the supposed million dollars that it was going to take to cut. <coughs> some of that might be done in this. Some of it, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't jump to any conclusions about how much, but yes, some of it. Um, related to, to that, it's a slightly off topic, but um, what are we doing about the alleyways? Um, I, there, there's one in my neighborhood that's been bothering me for a few years because it's just, be, it's going to become a bit impassable. Mm -hmm. And I thought at one point we talked about notifying the neighbors you know the property owners mm -hmm. about um, we did. okay so what are we doing if, i mean that whole alleyway well it's going to be one of those things you get that we have to do over and over and over again um, i mean i don't think it's been cut back for a couple of years so yeah, well, and i don't know it would be maybe is it is it the stafford one by any chance no it's not stafford it's um it's, it's one that cars do not go down so it could it's be grassy, it, it could be a it could be a vacated one it's a vacated it's one. It's not a vacated one, I don't believe. Well, it's just email me with that. Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just reiterate, I'm glad Kevin brought it up, that um, council last year did make uh, a decision that we should facilitate municipal broadband, even if we weren't actively funding it, so I think that's a great point to raise. Um, and so with that, uh, if there are any other comments, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, good. All right, so resolution 2018-23, how do y'all give you a break and I'll read it? Thank you. Yes. Thank okay. You. So this is celebrating the designation of the village of Yellow Springs as a bicycle-friendly community. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs takes pride in becoming the 18th community in Ohio to be currently recognized as a bicycle-friendly community and is committed to facilitating active transportation and recreational trails by promoting education, safety, and smart planning, and whereas the Village of Yellow Springs has intentionally created a community that is walkable, bikeable, and rollable for all ages and abilities, making our village a great place to live, work, and play, and whereas the Village of Yellow Springs appreciates the need for continuous improvement through maintaining and developing non-motorized infrastructure to be a healthy, thriving community, 
And whereas the Village of Yellow Springs embraces the economic health and environmental benefits of bicycling and other forms of active transportation and celebrates its proximity to the Little Miami Scenic Trail, the Buckeye Trail, we're a trail town, and a diversity of trail experiences that transform the American landscape. And whereas the Village of Yellow Springs plans to take action based on the feedback provided by the League of American Bicyclists, leading the region and state in making strides to improve bicycle pedestrian infrastructure, to achieve advanced levels of bicycle friendly community status, and whereas the Village of Yellow Springs has established a goal to develop a high quality integrated surface transportation infrastructure system that contributes to improved quality of life by promoting safety, recreation, environmental sustainability, health equity inclusion, and economic development, and is committed to executing initiatives recommended in its 2018 active transportation plan to be unveiled on June 27th, and by other smart planning efforts to maintain a vibrant and connected community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, in collaboration with the Mayor of Yellow Springs, does hereby, Section 1, recognize June 27th as Bicycle Friendly Community Day, highlighting the importance of sustainable transportation to continuously improve the quality of life for the Yellow Springs community. Section 2, express gratitude for the active efforts of the YS Active Transportation Committee, the Chamber of Commerce, the Community Foundation, Rails to Trails Conservancy, Bike Miami Valley, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, and many other organizations which have been and will be critical to accomplishments that significantly improve quality of life for villagers and visitors. Okay. Any questions or comments? Yeah. It's a mouthful. Bravo. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah. 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 We're accomplishing a, an important goal. Um, so uh, if not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Excellent. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. Who, who moved and who seconded? You didn't. Oh. Did I just jump right in? Wow. All right. I'll, uh, yes. I will uh, appreciate a motion to. Uh, I move. I second. Yes. OK. All those in favor signify by saying aye. I still. Yes, <laughs> I was so excited. All right. Um, okay, so citizen concerns, I'm assuming we don't have any. Um, special reports, we also don't have any. So with that, we're moving into old business. And uh, one of our two items is a, a report from the Housing Advisory Board. And Marianne, I'll turn yeah. it over to you. So we have 45 minutes for this discussion, so we should have some time for that. What I'd like to do is give an introduction and then basically open it up. So I'd like to start with uh, talking just briefly about the workshop that Denise and I went to called Harnessing the Forces of Gentrification, and Judith had asked for information about that. So um, gentrification, occurs, I mean, the term originally was used in uh, what the process that has happened and is continuing to happen in urban environments where the center city or near city neighborhoods become disinvested for various reasons and then uh, artists and other people who are want to come into low income areas come in, they're followed by others who like what those people have done, and then the original inhabitants get pushed out one way or another. So what's happened in Yellow Springs, and I think there are other smaller commu tourist communities like Yellow Springs, is somewhat different. There's similarities and differences. I think a big difference is that there never was the kind of disinvestment that there has been in, well, in all the cities around us, pretty much. So there's never that um, uh, opportunity to get property at a real low, abandoned property. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, oh, Yellow Springs, we, we've had the increase in costs, housing costs, land and, and housing costs. We also have a lot of the, uh, the tools in the toolbox that were recommended in this workshop. So uh, 
one of the tools that we have is that we have a community development corporation, which is a community land trust, which is home aid. Um, you could say that, that the village has been doing some land banking. The glass farm was purchased uh, and has been held for decades. And there's some other property that the, the village has purchased. Uh, and, and I think what we have that is not necessarily the case in some inner city neighborhoods is that we have a village government that's really want, wanting to work on making some changes so that we can have a mixed income neighborhood. But housing, um, clearly housing is an essential issue. I mean, somewhat, having a place to live is essential. And as Bill Faith said, and there have been an article in the Dayton Daily News, and then there was an article in the Columbus Dispatch about rental rates being unaffordable for even sort of more moderate income people. And he, he said, you know, housing is a basic need not only for family stability, for, but for community stability and for economic stability. And um, we're in a housing crisis. And I think that there's probably, there are very few communities that aren't experiencing it. And they may be experiencing it in different ways. I mean, you may have a Detroit or, or Youngstown, let's say, is might be a better example where I think one third of the properties, you know, are just abandoned. Um, and as some of us know, in Dayton, like you can go and buy a house for thirty or forty thousand dollars. It's not in that bad of shape. Um, and then you have places where it's very, very difficult to live. So I mean, all different things are happening. But uh, nationally, I think it's pretty fair to say that we have a housing crisis, and that the federal government, historically, and state or local governments have never been real aggressive in supporting housing as we have with other things like agriculture and big business so um anyway that part is that part um, the other thing that council asked for was a glossary of terms so i have included a glossary of terms as well as information about the area median income and if we, I'd like to do the glossary of terms first and just highlight a few, few mm -hmm. of them. So the first one is affordable housing. Now, there people have talked about, well, what does affordable housing mean? And, and clearly, it's not as precise a term as we might want. At the same time, it does have meaning. And I don't think we should just, uh, it, it can also be used, I think, as an excuse to not do anything because what does affordable mean? So there is a definition, and it's in here, and it's, uh, me, the definition is that you should not have to pay more than 30% of your gross income on total housing costs. Clearly, if you make a million dollars and you have to pay $300,000 a year, then you still have $700,000. So it's not at the upper end. It's when you start getting at the middle end and lower end that affordable housing is an issue. Community Development Corporation, I just want to highlight that, especially as we're talking about a designated community improvement corporation. There's, there's a distinction. A community development corporation that is a very broad definition for one, and it's, very, it's almost always focused on moderate, moderate, low, and lower income neighborhoods and communities, both housing and economic development. So there is an Ohio Community Development Association, Community Development Corporation Association. Denise and I went to one of their workshops, the workshop on gentrification. And they're very supportive of CDCs in Ohio and a uh, great organization. So Home Inc. is a, a CDC. And generally, CDCs have a certain portion, frequently one third of their board is lower income people, and that is the case of home aid. So they're embedded into the community and focused especially on lower income issues, and that's a distinction uh, with a CRC that's much more economic development, sometimes can do housing too. I'm not going to get into that because we'll talk about that. Uh, land bank. 
land bank is a noun and a verb. I mean, we can land bank property, but frequently a land bank is actually an organization that does that. Uh, land trust, uh, home bank is a land trust. In this case, a land trust maintains uh, ownership of the land and sells a leasehold agreement to the homeowners, which is uh, in perpetuity, uh, but the value is that it maintains the affordability of the housing, of the houses. Uh, Low-income tax credit. The low-income tax credit was started, I think, under Reagan, and it's a way that for-profit businesses, especially banks, contribute money to affordable housing, and they get write-offs for doing that. that. That's why they do it, because they get a tax break, and then they also get to uh, depreciate the property over, I think, a 10-year period. And if you can get a low-income tax credit development, that's uh, pretty cool. So, and it's very competitive. And it is for low-income any people, 60% of AMI and below. Uh, Section 502, I'm just, I'm bringing that up because Yellow Springs is considered rural and we can get money from USDA rural development, both there might be opportunities for grants for the village, but also homeowners can get very low interest mortgages through USDA, USDA rural development. Uh, the next item that I wanted to highlight was Section 8. Section 8 vouchers are something that low-income people can get, and if they can go to someone who uh, they can go and use that voucher to draw down the cost of a rental unit to what they can afford to pay. And if we can encourage more ability for more people to have Section 8, vouchers in this village, that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and those, those were the, the, the definitions that I wanted to highlight. And so with Section 8, you mean encouraging more property owners to well, be part I of Section really 8? I didn't really mean right? that, although yes, but there's a limit on how many vouchers are available. That was really what mm -hmm. I meant. And that's probably at the federal government level, I suppose. And we're not exactly in an environment in which the federal government is supporting. Right, but I, 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 I know There's two from parts. personal experience that land we want landlords to accept them, and we want people to be able to get out. Right, them. right. Yeah. Yep. So, in terms of encouraging, what I know what you said was you want to encourage. I thought what I heard you say. If if it's possible that Yellow Springs could do anything to enable more people who want to live here to have Section 8 vouchers, I think that would be a good thing. I don't know what it is. And, you know, I think the important distinction that maybe everyone already knows is, you know, we have low-income housing like Green Met, which is, you know, I, I mean, there's yeah. just waiting lists are ridiculous, yeah. mm -hmm. versus Section 8 where, I mean, a qualifying property owner can join the program and accept that. Well, but um, there's a waiting list for Section 8 vouchers. Right, so. mm -hmm. right. Well, I, I, I would encourage landowners to, you know, apply, yeah. submit their homes, you know, for inspection, et cetera. Um, and then if, you know, and when uh, renters come along that have qualified or that do have the vouchers, you know, then there'll be place, places here listed mm -hmm. and, and, and available for them. And that be part of one of our strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Because we are, I mean, by percentage we're very low compared to other municipalities in the county for just what's available for section eight so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay so then turning to the sheet of um, the area uh, area median income information and the definitions so uh, this is the numbers here are from 2017 and uh, I guess the 2018 numbers just came out recently. I got these from Chris and Homing, so um, they shouldn't be that much different. So um, they're all based on gross annual income, and 
area median income, median income would be the income in which equal numbers of people are below that and equal numbers of people are above, as opposed to average, which is average. And I'm not exactly sure why that is the term that gets used, but that, that is the definition that gets used in thinking about income levels. So the area median income in uh, Greene County, and it's really the Springfield-Dayton region, for one person is $44,502. I, I translated that if that were one person working 40 hours, well, or what, if that were an hourly wage for a full time, that would be a little over $20 an hour. Um, so that would be one person. Then, then a family of two, that would be 50875 and then it goes, I, I just included up to four people because we have very few families that are greater than four people. Um, so when we're thinking about moderate income, what we're talking about is in people whose income is between 80% of area median income and 120. So that would be, for one person, that would be someone whose income is $35,650 a year up to $53,402. So it's a sizable range. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the moderate range. Anything above moderate would be upper. It, we don't go into the different degrees of upper. Um, at least I'm not aware of that. So 80% or below is low income. So very low income, if you're at 50% or below, you're considered very low. If you're at 30%, you're considered extremely low. So for example, if, you make, if you're a single person and you're working full time, 40 hours a week, you probably don't get any vacation, but uh, it, so you'd be working 52 weeks a year, I guess. Uh, that would be $13,351. That would be a $6.42 six an hour. Most jobs pay more than that. I, what is minimum wage? Eight? Eight. 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 So it would be someone working at less than minimum wage. Uh, very low, though, comes in at $22,281. That would be $10.71. And so we have a lot of people who that's what they're making. So, um, you know, what I referenced a couple of newspaper articles, people who are making that amount are going to have a very difficult time finding a place, any kind of <coughs> decent place to live. So, um, I think the Dayton Daily News article said that the average hourly wage in Dayton is $12.86. And for, if someone made that money and they had a full-time job, they'd be $2, $2 an hour short of the amount they would need to rent a market-rate apartment, oh. two-bedroom market-rate apartment, which would sell for $765 a month. So, does anyone? I'm, I'm going to go into the... Oh, our, our housing initiative, but before we do that, does anyone have anything? Well, I have a question. I yeah. had some notes and lost them, but I knew I had a question about the um, the housing study that was done. Mm -hmm. um, so when I look at the chart you have here with the annual household gross area median income, um, I guess I was looking on here for that figure from the housing <coughs> um, should I see it here or housing maybe not since he's here? yes so he's doing this is Green County and he um, Patrick Bowen used some figures in terms of in terms of the chart that he included of, that said you know we need this many new houses this many new housing units mm -hmm. at this level he used a different um, uh, category than area median income. And I just emailed him today to say, could you please put that into this 
is the area median income for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I don't. I can come back with some more information from the housing needs assessment, but I didn't do that today. Okay. I wanted. I wanted to say a little something here. Um, I just sent late today uh, a document that is 2017 um, Ohio wages estimates uh, based on your uh, your occupation, and it's about 28 pages. So I wasn't necessarily thinking that it would be copied out for everybody, but I did print it out for myself, and I was just kind of looking at. Uh, the healthcare field because I'm a nurse and looking at and I think it's it's worth looking at some of the relevant uh, occupations in the village uh, and seeing what uh, people are getting paid actually it's quite interesting if you ever wondered what certain professions are paid generally um, so anyway and what I notice is you know if you look at the healthcare profession um, other than doctors um, you know, the, the wage range is really in this from very low to um, moderate income. Uh, I mean, depending on how many people in the family, of course. But um, so it's so anyway, I think that's helpful to kind of get a picture. Um, I wanted to say that housing, housing policy Yes, there's not been a lot of interest in affordable housing, but in fact, housing policy has been an important public policy area uh, for our government. Uh, just thinking in terms of um, the way that if we're paying our mortgage, uh, the, the tax write-offs that we get as homeowners, that was an important and is an important housing policy decision, you know. so keeping that in mind uh, when people get uncomfortable with thinking about affordable housing, uh, that that only is you know, helping some people, uh, just to keep in mind that in fact, housing policy generally helps the more well-to-do more than it helps low-income people yeah. because of those write-offs. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that the 30% uh, income for housing includes utilities. So, you know, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and I, I had another, I, I thought this was part of what you had on gentrification, but I thought it was, it's sort of uh, a description of what gentrification is, it, uh, saying that it's a process that dislocates traditional low to moderate income resident and changes the social fabric, the essential character of a neighborhood or community. And of course, I think that is what we are, that's the way that gentrification is very relevant to Yellow Springs. Um, I wanted to reiterate uh, the land trust that we have, Homique, what is so great about that model is that once you, once you create um, affordable housing, it remains affordable over time so that the public, um, the it, public investment uh, if there is a public investment, um, it's, uh, it doesn't go away after five or 10 years, which a lot of other models after five or 10 years, that probably it's around 10, more than five years, um, uh, then it goes back to a market rate and you've just lost all that benefit. And in a community like ours, you know, if we don't keep things affordable, I mean, over time, we will not have any affordable housing. Um, the other thing um, that I wanted to say is I was uh, just aware, you know, our, this was in Bowen's, uh, the Bowen report and the housing needs assessment, you know, our rental costs are in line pretty close to the regional, the region, um, but the houses, uh, you know, the cost to be a homeowner here is way out of range of what the regional costs are. And to me, that's something that's very important. I have written down here, we have 579 rentals. And Patty, I was gonna ask you, I was gonna look at, there are 1,900 households, is that correct? Uh, we have, I think it's 1,700. 
Well, yeah, we have a, we have about 2,000 services, but that okay. includes all the businesses. Yeah. I think they're probably about 1,800 housing. 1,800 housings. Yeah. So, you know, you take so there's about 1,200 homes uh, that uh, are primarily owner occupied. And I noticed a little tiny two-bedroom house in my neighborhood that went up for sale. Um, and now the median cost in the village for a house I think in recent years was 100, maybe last year, 188,000, whereas the region, regional median is, was 88,000. Um, so there's a really significant gap. This tiny two-bedroom home, it had been you know, painted and fixed up but very simple. Um, I got a little tour of it. Uh, the asking price was $168,000. It went on the market maybe a month ago, and I saw a pending sign out front. Mm -hmm. uh, so just that just shows us that really the, that 1,200 units um, of housing, none of it's affordable. <laughs> none of it is even with you know, a moderate income person, it's way, it's way high. So that just kind of, sh to me, that just really emphasized when I walked into that house, very sweet little house, but just very tiny. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just that said to me, any house uh, that's in any kind of decent shape is, um, you know, very, very high. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to make those comments. Okay. So Thank you. Now, given we, we know we have a housing problem, so last, <laughs> sorry. Last, no, thank you. No, thank you. Um, so last council meeting, I submitted uh, a draft housing initiative process that has come from the housing uh, advisory board, and so you've had a couple weeks to read it. So I'm very much hoping that if that I'd love it if that process could get approved as a sort of framework for a process and uh, we can talk about that for the rest of our time and in particular I'd like for us to affirm the uh, vision and policy statements but I'll go through each step briefly so the first step of this process was basically getting the housing needs assessment and I think we all felt like that really we have felt good about that. We're still in contact with Patrick Bowen. He's going to come back in August to meet with us again. We have been assessing uh, what resources we have, um, including uh, different kinds of consultants, um, different kinds of toolbox literature that talks about toolboxes, different kinds of organizations. That, that will be an ongoing process, I think. Um, then the third step here is to create a I'm calling it a vision policy statement. I don't know if that's exactly the right term, but mm -hmm. something that says, okay, this is what we want in, in a paragraph, a sentence in a paragraph. This is what we want. And then after that, the next, the next stage would be setting targeted goals. And that's, that will take some critical thinking. And then looking at strategies to meet the goals and then and developing, writing the plan and implementing the strategies. But if we don't have, if you don't have any questions about one or two, I'd like it if we could read this vision statement and, and I'd, I'd just like to get your feedback on this. So um, it says, Yellow Springs has a housing stock that enables a diverse community to live and work here. That would be a vision statement. And then under that, the Yellow Springs Village government with community members is committed to being a welcoming community which is environmentally and economically sustainable. This requires housing that enables people of diverse ages, races, ethnicities, incomes, skills, and lifestyles to be able to afford to live here. We aim for a balanced population across the age spectrum, valuing seniors as well as children and those in between single people as well as families. We understand that each villager contributes to the wholeness and health of the community and are particularly committed to those struggling to remain in Yellow Springs because of affordability challenges. We also welcome newcomers, newcomers wishing to move to our community. 
We encourage housing and workplaces that allow villages to live and work here. We recognize that while home ownership is a goal for many, there are many others for whom renting is the best option. And we seek a balance of both. Mixed income housing and increased density and all new development will be essential to reach our goals of promoting affordability and healthy neighborhoods. I'd like to stop there and get comments, feedback, questions. Mm -hmm. Well, a, a certain sentence uh, that grabbed me. First of all, I like the vision statement, uh, but then there's a sentence down there near the bottom, fourth line from the bottom. It's almost a repeat of that, but it, but, but I guess in a, in narrative form, it, it seems like it's not a complete sentence. It is a complete sentence, but it seems like it's, it doesn't say all of what it should say. It says we encourage housing and workplaces that out, that allow villagers to live and work here. Um, again, it sounds visiony, uh, but it, I don't know what it means, in the narrative form. Uh, like, are there some words missing, or what is it that we are discouraging, or what's happening, housing what are we not doing? Development? Ask me, mm -hmm. say again, please. Housing development? Yeah, that would be something more tangible that we could be encouraging to, 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 to happen or to come into being. So, you know, I don't have the right answer, but I'm just saying it struck me. I, I is was, awkward or incomplete? Yes. Yeah, it looks at, and it's almost the exact thing as the vision statement, as the very top wow. sentence. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. so uh -huh. so it if it doesn't say more, it, it seems out of place. And there's certainly a great opportunity <coughs> to say more, more something tangible that you are encouraging or we are hoping to bring about. So you, you would like something like we encourage housing development that allows villagers of all income levels. To live and work here. That sounds great. Anything in that neighborhood, no pun intended. Yeah. Well, and something like that. And, and if I can just kind of uh, connect onto that, um, I, you know, I'm not sure. I, we don't need to go totally in depth on this, but I was kind of thinking a similar thing about um, making sure that. Uh, our various amenities, our schools of excellence, uh, you know, that families are accommodated, that, um, you know, our professors at Antioch College have places to live. And um, I'm also not sure if, if that's quite captured here, if this is even the place for it. I mean, I overall like this statement, but I want to make sure that, that we are sort of recognizing beyond being environmentally and economically sustainable that um, we are, you know, again, uh, attracting folks that can appreciate the amenities of the village. So. It's, it's almost an opportunity to be the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you to be <laughs> You guys are much better at words than you <laughs> But yeah, yeah, Brian. I think your your point is right. If I mean, there, yeah, this when you were trying to talk about how all encompassing, you know, the village is. I mean, you you you're almost touching on the thing, the reason that people want to live here in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just for the sake of living here. That there, there, there ought to be a reason for it. So yeah, it could be an opportunity to just mention a couple of the a couple of those pillars, if you will, of the of the community. I'm happy for, uh, not necessarily right here, but for anyone who feels they'd like to have input into the statement to do that. Mm -hmm. Lisa, do you I have a couple comments. Mm -hmm. um, um, so sometimes I struggle with, um, you know, because my brain goes into implementation. I have a hard time just staying in vision. And, um, so at a vision level, the idea of aiming for a balanced population across the age spectrum is notionally makes sense to me. But then I think about like how do you 
how do you achieve that when, you know, people are just like naturally getting old. So, you know, it, the, the age spectrum is going to shift yeah. naturally. Okay. So we're not going to have quotas. You know no, what I no. mean? And but, so, I mean, I know you're not saying we're gonna do that, no, but there's a little- But I mean, there's one way where we can go, which is mm -hmm. how we're going, yep. becoming a retirement community. Mm -hmm. that, that's what well, we're becoming. We're kind of there, yeah. Or we can say, okay, we're, we're gonna be creating some housing units that mm -hmm. are affordable and attractive to young adults, young people with families, yeah, so I guess maybe um, being being more um, specific that we're not aiming for a balanced population. We're aiming for a housing mix that is attractive to, that's, that's what it's about, always tying it back to the, the housing mix, not about the population. It's, I hate to say it, but this may be one case in which build it and they will come actually. Is a strategy that um, mm -hmm. makes sense. Generally, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. Um, and, and sorry to interrupt, but just to throw in here, this is where I'm imagining this kind of balance between, you know, we want to have this diversity, but also complementing the amenities of our village. I mean, I, I think that's where this kind of goes. Uh, complementing the amenities. Well, so again, you know, it's not just about you know, having like, you know, an exact amount of each sort of no. age and whatever group, but I mean, we also have to think about what our village offers. And so I think that could help bring in part of this kind of practical aspect of the policy. And that's, I keep on coming back to the schools um, because, you know, what, I, what I'm hearing them say over and over is we need families here and we've got great schools. Um, so I, I think some appreciation of those two aspects. Well, and, and to, to finish my second point, yeah. I think we're kind of heading in a similar direction because I see there's a tie-in to um, employers too, right. so the schools and the employers, and so that's the important interconnection between economic development and the housing plans as we've just discussed a little bit earlier, if all of the jobs in town are minimum wage, then we're not creating an opportunity mm -hmm. to have a diverse community where people can live and work here mm -hmm. because they're fall falling in the very low AMI. Mm -hmm. So as important as housing is, we have to equally yeah. focus on ways to bring employers into town that pay higher wages so that people can afford to live here. So um, I think, you know, it says economically sustainable. I think there's a, you know, there's a, a whole nother, there's a whole nother story in those two words. Where is that? The first sentence. Committed to being a welcoming community which is environmentally and economically sustainable. Mm -hmm. All right, so that would be an expansion on, on that. So, Lisa, I guess I want to ask you is, uh, you know, we aim for a balanced population. If, if the word balanced weren't there, would it be more palatable? Well, no, I'm thinking more we aim for a, for a balanced stock of housing options mm -hmm. okay. that are attractive to people, single-feet people as well as families all across the age spectrum. I think we're aiming at a different housing mix. Um, just to comment on what you said, uh, it sounded like you were saying, you know, people are getting older, so as they die, uh, <laughs> uh, their houses become available for younger families. But in fact, um, I don't think that's necessarily. I, I wasn't the case. saying that at all. Okay. Oh, I, I guess. And I've heard people kind of with that idea in mind, and it is, I had this conversation with somebody associated with the senior center, and I believe the last summer was saying how many retired couples were walking into the senior center wanting to move here. Right, so, no, I wasn't saying that at all. That was a totally different topic. I was just saying we're not, we're not, we're not setting a target population mix. We're setting a target at housing mm -hmm. mix. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. It sounds Appreciate a little. That mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 
I don't know, I, I'm a little uncomfortable, Brian, with what you just said, because it feels, um, I was, uh, to me it feels uh, a little, you know, it's uh, sort of saying, you know, we need people culturally like us. Um, and, you know, uh, so anyway, that feels a little uncomfortable to me. Um, well, and that's the way it sounded to me, or people who appreciate, uh, well, I mean, people could appreciate different parts of the village's amenities and strengths. Um, so maybe, maybe that is an okay way to think about it. Um, that's the other thing. But people with minimum wage, I mean, we have a lot of uh, services in this village. I mean, people are probably getting a little more than minimum age, but not much more and for those people to live here we just got to have more lower income housing you know lower cost housing um so that uh yeah it's great if we can get some businesses who pay better who pay who are able to pay better we have a lot of little shops and so on who that is you know people working there are not going to be uh getting too much above a minimum wage i wouldn't think so yes is there anyone uh who who would like to work with me on making some changes to bring back Grants Company in this wording? Well, you see? Sure. Okay. okay. And Judith, I want to say I, I appreciate the, the caution that, that you bring up. I, I am thinking specifically about sort of fixtures of our village, like our schools, that, you know, I think, I, I'm just not convinced that Yellow Springs is the ideal place for everybody. So I, I want us to think about, you know, that particular thing. And, and, and I'll be honest, I do want to make sure as we're prioritizing, I know that Home Inc. right now is working on senior housing, affordable senior housing. So I am expressing, you know, one of the main concerns I hear from our school population that we are not currently prioritizing families. So that, you know, that's the point I, I want I to make I am sure. with you on that. Yeah. That's Okay, well, so there's the, the setting the goals, developing strategies, um, developing the housing, housing initiative plan, and then starting to implement them. I'm not, we're probably time-wise, we're getting near to the, does anyone have any, anything they want to say in particular about the other stages? Um. So I was at one of the information gathering sessions and, um, you know, the phrase trailer home uh, was tossed around. I mean, I like modular home in, in, instead, just because <laughs> modular is modular and it's a home, et cetera, et cetera. Trailer, I think it, you, can go, you, you can go, your mind can go too far uh, in one direction. Uh, so if you really mean, you know, trailer been pulled on a hitch that's what it should say are you talking if i yeah in the i, in, I use i think uh, mobile home okay so maybe it's okay it's just I, it, it, it was it was getting tossed around and it, really the word trailer the session i was at it was trailer oh home. well yeah well, and so people, maybe when i re see mobile i'm i'm trying to oh, fight no. that image so that's no. it's just I mean, me what i have listed here in strategies is like just general categories we're not saying we're going to do mm -hmm. any of these right okay this is just these are this is these are the kind of strategies mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. okay so we're not there yet right but the housing advisory board will be working on pulling right. those together to bring to council mm -hmm. after we do the goal thing. right so and another thing and this will be the last thing i say about this when we talk about our stock of homes um, apartments in particular well, not just apartments but when we talk about the stock the available mm -hmm. stock that's out there um, are you interested in in either making a statement or uh, opening a discussion about short-term rentals yes and I don't mean tonight 
no, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but yeah, whereas, and, and I'm not begrudging anyone, you know, who who you know has a uh, a place that they want to uh, generate income from. You know, so you I, mean transient lodging? Ooh, is that the? Because yeah, short-term rentals so is out of our yeah. out of our uh, Thank nomenclature. You. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, transient lodging. Yes. Yeah. I think it's not going to be an easy thing. Und it's understood. Difficult. But I just yeah, think I when you. Been, we've talked about it. I have been. I'm aware that it's happening more. Mm -hmm. And there's some investors that are buying up small homes mm -hmm. at night. But it's also going to be very tricky. I think. I understood. But I think in, when, when you but start the off the your answer, position. Yes. Yeah. I see that as mm -hmm. one of those kind of strategies that we need to be looking at. Okay. Just wanted to thank you for the glossary yeah it's really there's so much work that's gone into this i really appreciate it and the glossary is a very helpful addition thank good you. thank you excellent okay yep yeah, thank I'm you yeah all right perfect um yeah great report uh okay so our next item is the utilities conservation education program rfp patty um, okay, this was uh, brought up at the Energy Board first. They've been kind of trying to work around this for over a year uh, at least. They've talked to a couple of companies, Empower and also Go Sustainable. Um, we've talked to briefly to a local consultant, and I was asked to bring a draft RFP for utilities conservation. Um, education for residents and businesses here in the village. Um, so that is what you see in front of you. It's got a little bit from uh, the things that we have talked about at the Energy Board. And, and when I say this, I say utilities conservation because in my mind it is not just electric. It is electric, it's water, uh, your water affects your sewer, it's all of those things, it's how to recycle. Um, you know, even though that doesn't really affect your, your bill, but it all kind of ties together. My biggest concern with this RFP is that with all of the talk, with all of the discussion that we have had at the Energy Board, we have not come up with a specific list of deliverables. And I am one of those people who am, am hesitant to write an RFP for a consultant without saying, I want you to show me how you're going to do this particular thing. Um, and the, it's a difficult discussion because we've talked about, you know, we say, well, let's have, let's have a utilities conservation fair or event where we have, you know, the, the utilities folks are sitting there, but we also have people some from, say, Home Depot to show you how you can uh, put this displacement thing in your toilet or we have giveaways for uh, programmable thermostats and if you enter the drawing we have three of them that will have a local contractor put in your house or so and every time something comes up where somebody says well you know we tried that before and we didn't really get a very good response mm -hmm. and so not having been here to see those previous efforts I don't know exactly what they entailed so Again, this is the RFP I came up with. It's obviously very brief, but um, that's my concern, is not having something specific that we're telling that consultant that we want them to achieve. I, I have a concern, sort of related to what you're saying, I guess, is that things like, I'm mostly concerned about lower income people in particular, being able to benefit from well, I think and, we should say moderate to lower. Okay, moderate to lower income people. But frequently, the people who benefit from this kind of thing are the people who are more, you know, savvy, or they right. they they're thinking about this, and you know, they come in and they usually more upper income people are. Mm -hmm. And and that Marianne was actually part of what came up in in the discussion is that this is normally. Uh, ends up benefiting people who aren't necessarily the ones who need the benefit as much as others. And it it's only going to be education? No. I'm, I'm, well, I'm saying this because I know that there are some communities in Louisville ha, used to do this where they have a, I think they call it a repair affair. And they plan it for the whole year and then at a certain time, in the summer, 
volunteers come into low, moderate, low income houses, and it could be rentals, I suppose, mm -hmm. and actually make some kind of repairs and things. Like that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and actually it, it does say education, but um, for instance, part of the education would be this is how you can do your, uh, this is how you can weatherize your house, and we have people who can come in and help you do that. Um, part of the PBL that Johnny and I went and talked to, um, you know, I can't remember her name, Vicki. Vicki Hitchcock. Hitchcock, thank you, uh, about over at the schools was um, that it would not just involve the, the fourth graders, but it would also involve the high school students who would learn to do these things and then as part of their community service would take that out into the community under the supervision of someone who knows how to do this and help out at different homes. But that's the question is how, to, and that is kind of an education thing with folks about this is how you do this and, and, and how, to, you know, but then again, the question becomes, are you going to spend money on the consultant to tell you how to do that, or are you going to spend money on finding a way and doing it yourself? And this is what the Energy Board has been, you know, struggling with for a year, is how do we make this work in a way that actually benefits those in the community who need, need this benefit? Is the repair affair in Louisville, is that focused on issues related to you? So it can be. I mean, it could be like insulating and, um, you know, um, caulking and stuff like that. But it isn't only that. And it's, this, and it's particularly lower income or and older people who can't do the things themselves or can't afford to have. And it's a big community building thing, too. And, and I think they get, you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, places like that to, get to donate. To donate. Mm -hmm. Lisa? So uh, yeah, you know, one thing that comes to mind um, is that the deliverables, asking uh, for the deliverables from people who are submitting a proposal mm -hmm. is a way to tap, tap into their creativity right. in ways that a person writing the RFP, if they said, you know, touch these six points, um, we, we might miss something. But what isn't here that maybe would help with clarity is desired outcome statements. Mm -hmm. right. So in other words, the problem, you know, what we are trying to solve, <laughs> what we're trying to achieve in terms of outcome is to impact. What are we trying to right, achieve? Right, if we're, right. So if we say what we're trying to achieve, right. then, then they can say, so tell us what you'll do to achieve that. Right. And I think that would, if, if I put myself in the position of a consultant writing a proposal, uh, that's what I would want to know. Mm -hmm. But but what, again, this is this is the ongoing discussion. What is that that we want to achieve? We well, have the one thing I heard One thing I heard this evening, and I, I saw a head nodding down the row here, is to um, implement both doing, doing actions mm -hmm. and education that impact moderate to low income people. And that was one, that's an example. It probably could be articulated more. And then we could cut clearly. even, we could cut into and more to talk about, I mean, we wanna see decrease, you know, I mean, things that you can do to decrease your consumption of, mm -hmm. you know, utilities. Um, so, you know, yeah, to- Yeah, measurable differences in right. monthly bills. Um, so this makes me wonder, I mean, Judith, could this go back to the energy board to help well, with we're this meeting part? we're meeting tomorrow, and I talked to Rick today, Rick uh, Walkie, who chairs the meeting uh, and told him this would be on the agenda. Okay. so yes, because even if um, they don't have nuts and bolts like these desired outcomes, I mean, it yeah. seems like they'd be a perfect group to think about that. yeah have has the energy board looked to what other communities have been doing? Like I just Googled successful community energy uh, something or other and came up with community engagement, a potential transformative path to greater energy efficiency, MIT, 16 studies, I think, or something. I mean, that's just one of the things that came up. I don't know. I don't feel like um, 
the energy board's been able to think about it very well. Uh, just I don't know that it's where their strengths are. And um, so, you know, um, I mean, I've said several times where um, the council specifically wanted, you know, to provide help to the community to reduce their utility bills and particularly, you know, low and moderate income people. But um, n not much has been accomplished in those discussions, I don't mm -hmm. feel like. So it is on the agenda right. for tomorrow. And, and Jennifer, <coughs> I won't be there, but Johnny will be there. Oh, excellent. Okay. Cool. Cool. Well, I'd like to give it one more try, um, but I think at the end of the day, we could come up with some concrete things, you know, related to what Lisa's saying. Because, mm -hmm. I, I mean, again, what what hasn't happened before is results, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so I, you know, I want to see lower utility bills, less consumption, facilitating, you know, transitioning into, you know, more economical energy kinds of things. I mean, I don't know all the words, but I mean, I think we can come up with that stuff. And then I like what Lisa said, let them be creative when we put it out there. Right. How can and, they see that done? And, and that is one of the benefits, but but I just don't feel there's enough direction. Yeah. And this isn't ready to go out yeah. for sure. Apparently, Cincinnati has a program. Well, Cincinnati is working with Go Sustainable, and Go Sustainable uh, because Cincinnati got a big Duke grant um, to fund that program and. Uh, so they're working with Go Sustainable, which is one of the companies that we talked to that we thought we had ready to come in here, um, or that was Empower, actually. They're working with Empower. And uh, we thought they were ready to come in here, and then they said, oh, we're going to reorganize, we'll get back with you, and now you can't reach them. And so, so here's one, Connecticut, Neighbor to Neighbor Energy Challenge, and they use AmeriCorps volunteers. So if you could actually... I mean, you'd have to have it be administrated by someone who could supervise that kind of thing. But actually, if you could have, I, I don't think it's enough to just sort of teach someone how to do something. I mean, it's got to be hands on, you know, especially say lower income people. Like if you have kids, you know, you're working a couple mm -hmm. jobs and you have kids. Yeah, have, have, I think it, you need to have someone come in and help do it. it. When we finish this discussion, I think we need to go back for a minute because I think Lisa forgot to mention something during her utility discussion. I haven't talked about utilities yet. Okay. Well, it all sounds mysterious, but let's... Me too. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You forget to say no, something when you didn't. Did I talk? Mm, that's not... <laughs> Karen Wintrow, uh, Patty, does, is AMP doing anything besides um, Efficiency Smart, or and are they still working with Efficiency Smart? They they have Efficiency Smart. They have uh, developed an a la carte version of Efficiency Smart, where you can choose this part but leave this part out. And it is something that we could potentially look at. But again, that is funded by a per unit charge on your bill, and I'm not sure that it, they, the reason that we discontinued it is because. Um, there were not enough people take residents getting a benefit from it. There were certain businesses that were getting a, a benefit from it, but um, not residents. And but it it's, was, but I think what's missing here is the administrative piece because staff. It's not something that staff can handle, that's and that's why we. Well, we had to go to them in the first place right. because that was part of our settlement for a lawsuit, but. Um, Duke, Cincinnati's using Duke. I mean, DPNL has programs. It is the for-profit utilities that are funding these programs for most communities. So if the village doesn't have our energy provider AMP helping us, I mean, that's just a resource. It's a resource I don't think you should ignore. I think, and I know that, that the energy board is, is not keen on energy smart and, and really, you know, really insisted or, or really pushed for us to leave but I think that maybe you should introduce reintroduce what options that they have available just because it's an at it's a ready resource okay so it sounds like we've got some actions to take and um, 
Uh, ideally, uh, we'll get some solid things from the Energy Board. If not, we will figure this out and get this out there. All right, and thanks for mentioning AMP. Um, okay, so what did you think Lisa forgot? Um, that? Did you want to mention a Miller fellow possibility? Um, well, uh, um, we weren't really going to give too much of an update on this until our, I think our <laughs> next agenda, but just to hit this really quickly, we did have a meeting this last week of an advisory group with Patty talking about the Roundup program. And um, in terms of capacity building, um, have decided that it would be helpful to apply for a, a Miller Fellow mm -hmm. who might be able to help to uh, staff to generate some of this capacity. And, so that we talked about that. Yeah, and the, it's the a public private partnership with the Community Foundation. And, and, and those applications are due by the 11th. I got notified Saturday. So that's why I, I think. It'd be better to try to figure that out now so I can work on that application. Huh. All right. Well, just keep in mind we've had two Miller Fellows before mm -hmm. um, and we didn't have the capacity to appropriately supervise them, so they were not that successful. Um, so, I mean, if we're making a commitment to this. Yeah. So, is something uh, with the Community Solutions who would be helping with Roundup program? Mm -hmm that person would be sitting at that intersection. So you're right, though. I mean, I wasn't aware yeah, that there had been had issues a, before. Uh, had a Miller Fellow, and they were supposed to get this online database of services. Mm -hmm. We put money into it. It never happened. And Community Access Panel had a Miller Fellow mm -hmm. to get this volunteer program and all that's going, and it just faded away. And I think the purpose of this one, and Lisa, correct me if, if I'm not remembering this correctly, but it would be to help develop the promotional materials and the and, and be that kind of gatekeeper uh, to to say here are the applications that Community Solutions has to look at and be that go between. Is that correct? Yeah, we're talking about the Roundup program now. Right. I mean, that's what this is about. Roundup program, right. not about this education piece. Right, right. But I, I'm just bringing it up because if we're going to apply, we have to apply and I need to get working on the application because it's due by July the 11th. Yeah, I wasn't aware that there had been a history of. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, well, I guess you've heard my opinion. Uh, I mean, we can talk about it more no, on I, July 2nd, but. Yeah, I think you have to have a whether it's AmeriCorps or Miller Fellows, you have to have a structure. So but but if we just we just switched totally switched topics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That Miller Fellow has nothing to do with this educational piece no, I'm at not all. About right. That. Yeah, no, it, it it's a totally separate topic. No, no. So, You're talking about utility roundup, right? Yeah, which is just administration of a specific program. Yeah, and, and, the, and the only reason, again, that I'm bringing it up is because I got the application deadline and I would like to get started on it if we're going to do it. But. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, it was brought to me as an idea to go with a Miller Fellow around a specific program. <coughs> we're not reporting on that program tonight. Um, so I, I'm um, not quite sure what to say. Well, uh, let's put it on the agenda for July 2nd. That still gives us a week and a couple days, and it's not a very long uh, application if it, we. It actually gives me three because I'm on vacation, remember? But that's okay. Um, we'll figure it out. Okay. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, and I, I also any? would want Kevin to speak to this too because he's been <laughs> the lead kind of on the Roundup program too. So. Yeah. Um, I think we can. Pat, if you're concerned about the lead time for the application, I think we do have enough. Yet yeah, it was out of context with the, the switching gears, and I think that's where uh, Lisa has an issue with. But I think we do have enough information based on uh, what came out of the meeting the other day. Might want, we may want to swing back by the folks at Community Solutions uh, to make sure they have a complete understanding mm -hmm. of their responsibilities with and for that Miller Fellow. Uh, but if you feel like you need to get started with it now, I, I would support that. And um, I guess, are you going to be here for the for the Schumann thing since we're mixing up conversations now? <laughs> um, actually, I have a meeting at Chris's office uh, mm -hmm. downtown at that time uh, on on that 28th. Okay. All right. So. Well, I will. I will 
talk to you later and I will make sure that Kat knows that we're concerned about the timeline for the application. Okay. Okay. Okay, and just remember, you know, when we do make decisions like that, for Patty to spend time on that application, that means there are other things she will not be able to spend time on. So I, I just want to caution um, when we make those decisions. Okay, Judith, uh, you want to talk about Justice System Task Force briefly? Oh, I just wanted to uh, work, at, work at the two-year anniversary of Justice System Task Force. Yeah, not when we did, uh, created it, we had said about a two, we said, you know, around two years uh, as a time frame. And so um, uh, Lisa and I talked about this and thought it made sense that JSTF is uh, at the moment trying to prioritize its final work based on, you know, the original uh, direction of Village Council. And so it seems to make sense to try to go for it to continue its work till the end of the year and then um, I'll be bringing a proposal uh, talking with Lisa and the JSTF members for uh, what I view, what I'm uh, envisioning as an, as a commission that would 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 take up the work more long term um, beyond 2018 and I'm imagining I'm going to bring uh, a draft to JSTF in July, or this was my plan, and uh, get input uh, after talking with Lisa and thinking that it would come to council probably in the fall, early fall. So, okay, so right now it's on for July 16th, so we're talking about moving that forward. Uh, it's the biennial. Yeah, I see it there. So what does this mean? Well, what that means is what you were just saying in terms of the review that's supposed to happen at the end of the two years. I know, but um, what, I, what I'm suggesting is that because people are in the middle of work that um, we postpone that. Does that make sense? Wait or do you want something? Year. Wait till the end of the year. Well, I'm hearing two things though, right? One is uh you know finishing the work until the end of the year but then the other is the proposal about the status of the task force right is that right. okay um so maybe we should talk about those separately i mean i i i think that's great i mean there's no reason not to finish up the work until the end of the year is my my personal thought um when we but i guess the decision about what happens next right. i don't know if that do you think that needs to wait until the end of the year? Or no, I, I was saying that um, a draft would be brought to uh, JSTF in, at the July meeting and that unless council wants to look at it first, my thought was that council would want to, you know, have that input included mm -hmm. and then uh, would be brought to council in mm -hmm. the fall. Okay. Uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. Kevin? Um, I guess in general, with respect to commissions and boards, um, I am from time to time in a position where I need to remind um, commission members that they you know, serve at the behest of council. Um, and I guess I, I, I envision the general flow of things being that council would submit to the commission what our expectations are um, as opposed to being asked to approve what the commission wants to do well so, i hear what you're saying um the but the justice system task force i know feels and i mean there's some point to this that they've been working on these issues and that they would you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be, and it probably will not be a final draft when it's brought to council. Um, I envisage it, actually, I was thinking it might come from Lisa and I if we're in agreement. If not, it may be coming from me. It's not coming from the task force. Um, I'm thinking it's going to not be exactly, it's not going to be focused in the same way as JSTF. I mean, it'll be, uh, it's 
you know, the focus will be changing or I'm, a, I'm thinking um, as I've been working on it. It's not going to be exactly the same. It's not going to be totally unrelated, of course, either. It's going to be working on a lot of the same kind of issues. But um, if that's not comfortable to counsel, you can come to counsel first. But I thought you would want to hear the end. I know committee members feel very strongly, you know, it was uh, accidentally, I guess, put on uh, an ad for our agenda in June and uh, people were very upset. You didn't get our input. And I said, you know, that was a mistake, I don't, uh, you know, uh, that was put out by whoever because nobody checked with me. So, um, so you know, the task force and I think it makes yeah, sense that they, wanna, that they want to have input or that they want to be able to look at the recommendation and provide their thoughts and then that may or not be incorporated into it. Well, I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm certainly fine with it. The task force had a two-year right. time period. It didn't start until the end of, I mean, it was, uh, it started in maybe it, September. it took us months yeah, to, get while, to get it going. People to apply and vet everyone and get started. It took so it hasn't been two, it has not been work, it has not been working. Probably September, October is when we really got yeah. started. Well, like Brian said, I think it's two separate issues um, you know, in terms of. Yeah, you know, but how do you feel about, you know, are you uncomfortable with the uh, <coughs> Justice System Task Force having input on uh, a draft proposal that would come to council? I would like the way I understand the charter to be. Uh, the way it was written would, was that there were a list of tasks that the task force was asked to perform. Um, they were given, let's call it October, for okay. the sake of argument. Um, so this October would be two years. Um, and then council would look at the work that council asked the task force to do I'm imagining the process now, going through a checklist. We asked you to do these five things. Okay, those five things are done. And oh, by the way, these other 12 things just showed up. They were good things, and six of those 12 things are done. You know, go through that review, um, and then council, you know, as, as a body would decide, okay, we, what was our thinking? I wasn't here, but what was our thinking when uh, you create a temporary task force with a two-year timeline and say that you would review what are the options and, and again I'm not asking these rhetorical questions what are the what were the envisioned options you come become something else you end your existence you trail off into the sunset <laughs> move uh, that responsibility to another existing commissioner board I mean these are the things I believe that need to be considered and and council uh, would would make those decisions and pick the word you want dictate suggest ask <laughs> that result you know to the group and this is just me making up a process on the fly but this is what I can imagine what was being thought uh, two years ago then as a result of that depending on what that decision is then the task force would do or become whatever council decides and I'd be comfortable well, with whatever we I decide. don't see uh, I felt as a council member we can bring recommendations mm -hmm. I was assuming since I've been the liaison this has been important work that mm -hmm. I've been you know in the middle of I wasn't asking the task force to bring a recommendation uh, right. but I hear what you're saying um, well let me so we'll be having our first meeting in July let me think about it and I hear what you're saying. But, uh, yeah. so, you know, so rather than bringing counsel, so you're talking about we review what's been done, what's right. not been done, um, what's trying to be completed, and, uh, and uh, provide some direction. And that's another way to do it. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that's the, the, the way to move forward. Okay, and what, so for me, I guess I just want clarity because part of the reason that it was on an agenda in June is because back in April, 
we put this on future agenda items and we keep on pushing it. So I guess I, I want to, it sounds like we're not going to be ready on July 16th. So where should we move it to? Um, September is what I was thinking. Okay. Uh, Kevin, are you comfortable with that? Sure. Okay. I'm just one of five. Can that be the fourth or the seventeenth? Well, we'll figure that out later. Okay. Um, all right. <coughs> New business. So we've got considerations around the purpose of the designated community improvement corporation. Lisa. All right. I'm starting a timer because we're running late, and this is also kind of a big topic. So um, hopefully you've had a chance to review the document. I don't want to read it aloud, but I want to hit some high points. First of which is to thank the members of the Economic Sustainability Commission for accomplishing a lot of thinking and writing and decision making really quickly to bring this to our body tonight. Um, so I think the uh, earlier conversation about the importance of economic development as it relates to um, housing and the overall life uh, wellness of the village was a good segue into the reason why a designated community improvement corporation is um, a, a good idea. Um, the idea is that this can be an organization that provides a platform for the kind of collaboration, broad and inclusive representation and coordination that we are lacking right now in our community among some of the major stakeholders the need to accomplish some overall strategic planning and think about innovative funding approaches um, to move forward on projects that could make a difference that would always be consistent with the village values and annual goals. So as you've picked up by reading this, you know that a DCIC is a 501c3 um, that exists primarily to promote economic development and new business development. However, um, as you write your code of regulations for your DCIC, um, we have a lot of freedom to design what we want our DCIC to be. That is both a blessing and a challenge because we have to decide what we want it to be. Um, we see here, and I'm on the third paragraph, the proposed mission of a DCIC would be to serve as a coordinating and planning entity to provide funding and oversight for projects that ensure the economic and cultural vitality of the village of Yellow Springs for businesses and nonprofits, residential and infrastructure development. Um, the goal of increasing the tax base is a major reason to create a DCIC, but we feel strongly, the Economic Sustainability Commission feels strongly that the DCIC in Yellow Springs should be inclusive of the entire community and support the village values and annual goals. Um, you see in the next paragraph, um, in terms of constituency, not less than two-fifths of the governing board of a DCIC must be elected officials representing the participating political subdivisions. So the council is a political subdivision, the school board is a political subdivision, that language is a little confusing, maybe. Lisa, yeah. Um, just want to make sure. So it's not their, them or their designees, but it's the actual elected officials. Elected officials. That's right. Um, although there is less than a majority of, of elected officials from any single political subdivision. Um, we've talked a lot in economic sustainability about the importance of maintaining trust and transparency. And so uh, our DCIC would operate under the Open Meetings Act. So just as the council you know, says when we're gonna have meetings, there are gonna be open for uh, citizen input and uh, the um, commission uh, strongly recommended that the actual process of the DCIC would include citizen input. Can I ask you to lean back? It's just really hard for me to keep doing this. Um, so um, the next section then goes into um, appointment of representatives. Um, 
possible, you notice that is bold, black text, possible, um, is as follows with total membership not to exceed 11, um, up to four persons representing the village. So those are elected officials. Um, one representative of the Miami Township trustees, that's an elected official. Um, one representative of the Yellow Springs exempted school district. Um, and then five to seven at large members um, from both business and nonprofit organizations. Uh, the idea, um, you know, when you read about the DCIC is that by including a diverse set of stakeholders that have different skill sets and perspectives um, to have some people that are more business people as well as nonprofits creates a better balance for decision making. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there are broad powers that can include accepting, purchasing, leasing, and selling real estate. I'm not going to read this whole um, paragraph, but I want to point out a, a couple. I mean, the revolving loan fund is kind of an immediate need for a DCIC. Um, the uh, net profit tax is anticipated from Cresco, um, marketing the CBE, funding infrastructure projects like the fiber network, um, providing assistance to local businesses, funding residential and commercial real estate and other kinds of development. And also we talked about functioning as a land bank to facilitate transition of properties and uh, promote affordability of housing. Um, you know, as an example, uh, the, in Springfield, there's this wonderful old uh, building, um, the Myers Market. Um, they, in Springfield, they formed a DCIC that's called Spring Forward. They took our word, spring. <laughs> spring Forward. And that's a, a participation, participation from um, the, the government, but also the Springfield Foundation is really involved. You could look up that group online, and they've now successfully uh, entered into a real estate transaction to turn that building, um, the Myers Market building, into a, a full-time year-round market, and they're going to have a collective kitchen. And so, I mean, that's an example of, in Springfield, what their entity is zooming ahead to do. Um, in, in Fairborn, their DCIC is very focused on buying uh, kind of kind of derelict rundown real estate and turning it into something better. Um, but those are some, you know, our neighbors, what our neighbors are doing with their DCICs. Um, I want to highlight a couple of concerns that the commission had. Uh, the first one, to what extent do the participating political subdivisions give up their power or sovereignty over decision making? All right, so for example, by creating this entity, then, you know, like the village council is no longer making 100% of the decision, for example, about something that uh, maybe some property that's purchased as part of the DCIC. Similarly, the school board would not be making unilateral decisions. But it is an opportunity for these stakeholders and entities to come together and collaborate and problem solve and prioritize together and make decisions. So this is a, ch a challenging aspect. The but then DCIC. also just to clarify on that, but they could, all those decisions could yes, still come they back. They could. Right? right. If that's what we wanted to do. Right. So that like right. So like for example, we talked about um, would there be maybe a certain threshold of a deal or opportunity that if it's a certain type of deal, say for example, land purchase or a certain dollar amount, that all of those would have to come to council. You know, we could do that. Um, we just have to set those uh, types of decision-making authority and what I call kind of clip levels, right? To not, because you don't want to tie everything back to come to council because then, you know, you're just slowing, slowing down the ability of the DCIC to do its work. Um, well, and that's, that was my second point, Brian. I just hadn't quite gotten to that, but thank you. Can the DCIC act unilaterally on all or will the village council have oversight over some types of decisions? So thanks. I'll try to speed it up. Um, and then I'm not going to re review this whole page three, but this is just an overall timeline 
of uh, how we might continue as a council and the commission to work forward on next steps. Lisa, I have a question uh, to the extent that uh, when you're ready to um, bring the solicitor's office in for specific details, which I see is August 1st, <coughs> have you had any th th anything more substantive than just a general idea that money would be required for the CIC to perform some of its essential purpose? Have you talked about f how to fund it yet? Not specifically. I mean, we know that we have the revolving loan fund, right? That's a small amount of money. Uh, the Cresco fund, so that's kind of an idea that's sitting out there. But other than that, um, we haven't, no. And then uh, I, I didn't know, I don't recall seeing it in this, the use of the CIC uh, for infrastructure improvement and the opportunity to obtain some grant money that might be available. Was that? Right. We did put infrastructure as one okay. of the number four on page right. two. I got it. And in a prior document, we did mention that, you know, the CIC could go out for grants. You know, mm -hmm. we've talked about the USDA, for example, has got a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Can, I'm done in the interest of time. Um, I, go ahead, Judith. Well, well I, I had several questions. Um, who's, is, how, is the village a government staff staffing this? Who is, who's staffing it? So capacity is an issue, and we haven't made that decision. Um, so, but that, you know, that is an issue, certainly. Um, so we, there's been a suggestion that um, the village would provide some support via our village manager and planning and zoning, um, but again, that's that's totally you know open. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's not something we, but that has been something that's been discussed mm -hmm. by the ESC. But that's external support, but not part of the possible membership as outlined here. Right. right. And well, and some of yes. right. That's us. Yeah. Huh? Those four people. Two of them are council and two are staff. It's not four council members. And that was my question, was clarifying that. So two of them are staff? Yes. Well, okay. well, my question on that was, if you look at all those bullet points together, and thanks, Karen, for that clarification, you know, if you're not, well, I guess you have to do the math and shift things around. So I was going to suggest uh, that this say two to four persons uh, from the village, but then if it's expected to be two council plus right, two Right, because staff. they can't be a majority of right. and then, officials. Right, um, so, so, so that really changes my point, but I was going to say, mm -hmm. you know, where you got those swing positions at the five to seven, you needed to have swing on the other end uh, on, on the villages, make that two to four. So you could sh shift numbers around but still stay below right. 11. So some of the other DCICs that we've looked at have a, have a, uh, uh, village, uh, a community, uh, like have an employee that's more focused on the DCIC, um, some kind of a planning, they have some kind of a planning title or something like that, mm -hmm. that then they staff the DCIC. I, I guess I'd like to suggest, given our stretch staff, we mm -hmm. strongly consider taking maybe some of the Cresco money or something and having some We've also got, um, we've got economic development money um, I just think we having our used. staff staffing this thing would probably mm -hmm. be a mistake. Too much. Mm -hmm. What infrastructure funding was being thought about beyond the fiber network? We have not gotten that specific into <clears throat> developing what the tasks of the DCIC would be. That kind of specificity would be way down the road. And I also think it's going to be really interesting to hear you know, more about infrastructure needs. And when you think about infrastructure needs mm -hmm. of all of the stakeholders who might participate, so schools and, mm -hmm. you know, we, have, we haven't gotten to that level of detail. Yeah. It, and I think, too, you may want to make a differentiation between new infrastructure for economic development purposes, which is one thing, and maintaining the infrastructure you currently have, which is entirely different. And some, some grants apply to one thing and not the other. Some you can get for either or. And, um, you know, I, I, I know that um, just briefly that, you know, Richard Lapides did bring his idea of the, you know, Cresco money going to the DCIC to be 
metered out to the three entities, the three primary entities for infrastructure needs, and um, that's another potential. That's a po I mean, we yeah. that could we could do that. And, and I I support that particular idea myself as Thank a manager. You. The land bank, uh, I a concept. How is that relevant to Yellow Spring? Well, that was something that um, I know it's generally in the CIC. Right. Uh, well, that was something that um, Emily, Emily Seibel felt really strongly about having that in this document. Then how the DCIC could support affordable housing and have and function as a as a land bank. I mean, as as we talked about earlier in this discussion, disinvestment. <laughs> Disinvestment isn't really what we're looking at everywhere we turn, but there are some, <laughs> there's some buildings that, you know. Well, she highlighted foreclosures, and mm -hmm. she said um, we would be surprised at how many opportunities are lost mm -hmm. uh, through, mm -hmm. you know, bank foreclosures. And she says we and miss that, them. Yeah, we just miss them. Yeah. And she can't go after them fast enough. And so if we had a DCIC that had a process, to go after those, that it would be a real opportunity for the village. Yeah, and keeping in mind it's not just the village in this particular case, it's the mm -hmm. township mm -hmm. as well. True. Well, and I, I think that's the thing I want to emphasize is this topic is labeled considerations for the purpose of the DCIC because, you know, I want us to be cautious about if we want this really to be a collaborative effort, then if everything is dictated by council, I, I'm not sure we're going to achieve that. So. I think one thing we've got to, you know, decide on, and it's embodied in this document, is what are we willing to sort of relinquish, you know, to another body that could coordinate these efforts. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think every decision we make about what we might give to the DCIC, if it does, you know, if, if it all comes to fruition, we have to be careful about that, right? And we have to decide. You know, are we willing to give part or all of the Cresco money for a larger body, a more holistic body to decide, or do we want to, you know, make final decisions on that? I mean, I think that's part of what all this is about. Same with mm -hmm. land or anything else. We would, you know, we would have, that's why we, we're not giving up power, I mean, in relation to that question, right, unless we want to. Well, I mean, yeah, that's where it gets tricky because sure. we're the governing we're the representative body for the village. So. Right. So we might not do people some of those people. things. So we might not do some of those things, right? Mm -hmm. I was going to say, yeah, my, I am for uh, uh, designated CIC because it can do things that we can't do. And that fact that it's designated means that its meetings are, you know, there's a more tra there is more transparency. Mm -hmm. However, um, you know, the main body that's giving up authority, and it's not about us, in the, us us as individuals giving up authority that I'm concerned about. It's that in our organizational chart, the people at the top are the citizens of Yellow Springs. And so we're giving up a lot of authority through which they can influence, I think, and it, it takes away a lot of their abilities to influence, uh, uh, you know, what is basically, you know, public policy, or it's not public policy, I guess. Um, decisions, um, I would be very much against this idea of providing the Cresco money to the DCIC. And I think, you know, not that none of it should go, um, but I think, um, you know, given our affordability issue and the fact that there is going to be private land coming onto the market, you know, that's in the village, and how are we going to, so I was thinking about that money. Of course, council has to decide as a whole with the community um, what happens to that money. But I would not want to see it uh, just handed over to a DCIC. I would, the, the way that we give the villagers a voice is, um, is a big part of it is the purse string, it seems to me. Not that the DCIC can't find other places of funding um, but, um, I mean, the place you can see the extent to which we are taking away power of citizens is, for example, um, you know, the citizens, if they object to a decision, um, they don't have 
really a way to stop it if it comes out of the DCIC, other than public pressure, I well, suppose. <clears throat> I think they'd stop it here. So to me, <clears throat> each one of those decisions about what we task or, or what we give to the DCIC. So, you know, to me, an example would be that parking lot that we need to use in a better way, you know, on Railroad Street. So would it make sense to ask the DCIC to figure out a plan and, and put something out there for that? Because we don't have the time or capacity to do it, maybe. You know, and, but, you know, I think with each one of those things, we got to be careful. And the, and the only thing that I think we've really agreed to is the revolving loan fund, mm -hmm. right? We know we've got money. We want that to happen. That's, that's the start. Mm -hmm. So everything else could be about, you know, strategic thinking, coordination, um, but we have the ability to decide, and that's all public input, what would, you know, go to that board. I mean, I think the, you know, the fact that there's two members of council, I mean, they're not there, I just want to say it out loud, they're not there, you know, as individuals, they're there representing the council, right. presumably. So if there is some, uh, yeah, so it strikes me, council can ask the, which is what I had initially imagined, the, the CIC, you know, we want this to happen, you know, how can you help us with that? Mm -hmm. you know, some of mm -hmm. these things that the village council, the village government can't do, you know, legally. Um, or um, the CIC might have a proposal they'd bring to council saying, we would like you to fund this. I mean, that's the way I'm imagining it, not handing them a big piece of money, because that worried me when I read that, sure. wherever it is here. Um, uh, you know, this basically public money for a non, a, a not really public body uh, to be making those decisions. So, um, so that's the way, two ways I was imagining. I feel like, you know, for the sake of citizens, we need to have a place where they can weigh in and if they really object, really weigh in, uh, you know, before, you know, not just hand it over and at that point the citizens have a lot less say about things. So. Right. And, and again, I, I want to just reinforce that the Economic Sustainability Commission yeah, I felt strongly that. that there needed to be citizen, a citizen input process for all decision making. Mm -hmm. So what, what are your next steps? So um, we propose in economic sustainability, um, the next time we uh, meet, uh, we'll share obviously this feedback and then begin to work on a, a plan for outreach to talk to some of the other stakeholders about what they think about this and some of their ideas and concerns perhaps because we're only, we've only talked about it in council. And I know there have been some conversations already. I think Brian, you've been involved in some conversations with different stakeholders too, but to somewhat formalize that and come up with a kind of an outreach uh, conversation guide. One thing that's not on here, and I referred to it at the beginning of our meeting, is the Michael Schumann opportunity. Um, and th so there are going to be some discussions about the designated CIC with uh, various stakeholders across those three days. And so I feel like we're going to get a lot of great feedback from that, especially from somebody with an outside perspective who has done things like this in other communities before. Um, so I think that's that's something to keep in mind too in this process. Yeah, and I'm disappointed, but I'm I'm going to be out of town, so I'm not going to be able to participate in that conversation. But there'll be other other great minds. <laughs> <See. Nah. laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? Um, I guess I would would say if we stick to the timeline, the proposed timeline. Um, today we're giving feedback um, and then the next time we see this we would approve it in some fashion? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, approve a, a re revised version of this purpose statement and our outreach plan. And, and, and I think I would want to emphasize um, both Judith's and Brian's points, when you look at the seven things that are listed here, um, only number one have we already agreed to 
offer, if you will, to the DCIC, as opposed to committing at this point to have the DCIC do all of these things. So, you know, if it's if if uh, if there's a way of saying this is approved, thumbs up, and then all these other things are possibilities mm -hmm. that'll be addressed on an on as needed basis, uh, then we would then uh, agree. You know, right. I mean, we can break the list, but also we'll just keep using this word "black," possible, bolded, mm -hmm. to indicate that these are just ideas and they're cap they're potentials that could come to pass at some point, not things that anybody's saying we're going to do right mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. But the final proposal won't leave that line. But that there's possible tasks? Well, that all of these are possible tasks. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the Crespo one can be reworded. Um, I, I didn't hear any others that weren't potentially possible. Well, I'll weigh in. I support one. Uh, two is the Crespo thing. Yeah, I think we need to think about that. I support three. Uh, fund infrastructure, I think that needs a little thinking. I support five, six, and seven. I mean, it's some, something that I, I mean, like if the DCIC, for example, had funds to buy uh, buildings that are foreclosed upon, and then there's some process that they could be reused or mm -hmm. um, funding, uh, marketing the CD. I mean, I would assume council is going to have uh, input on that, but. And, and providing technical assistance to local businesses. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think on the, the infrastructure, I mean, if it says, I mean, I think the fiber network, it, that does seem like a good place, just it's, and maybe, you know, say, just take that, you know, fund infrastructure projects, including, it sounds like there's some other ideas out there you know, maybe there's just a rewarding that could. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing for me is with number two is the scope. You know, like not all of the Cresco mm -hmm. <laughs> proceeds, just I, I would imagine us saying, okay, we'll offer a portion of it and, and, and then not be concerned about what's done with it. Right. And, right. and not be concerned about the level of uh, control that we're abdicating, if you will. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you very yeah. much. Great report. Thanks to the ESC. Um, okay, manager's report. Um, so the implicit bias training is staying at the two original sessions on the 8th and the 15th of August. So um, I've heard from Kevin as to which uh, sessions he would like to attend. So reminder to everyone on council that you need to get back to me as to whether you're attending morning or afternoon uh, sessions. You need to attend one on the 8th and one on the 15th. Oh, um, okay. So I wasn't clear about that. So the one on the 8th is a duplicate whether you go morning or afternoon. Correct. Or and the morning. same with the one on the 15th. Okay. So you need to attend uh, one on each day. Uh -huh. And you can attend the morning in one and the afternoon in the other. You just have to okay. attend one on each day. I will get back um, to you. The, uh, I'm going to just go over the, the important things here. Uh, the first phase of the electric pole replacement that we approved with HITECH is going to begin um, Monday, today. Um, they are going to be working seven days a week for three weeks. Some of the work in Keith's Alley is going to be done at night, and we will make every possible attempt to notify the businesses and residents that live along Keith's Alley and are going to be affected, but it's some of the larger businesses, and we have to take them down when they're not when they're not up and running for business so um, we're starting to mark the uh, the work the valves for unidirectional flushing um, and in your package you find a recommendation from Denise Swinger um, to um, add RV parking to the code of general offenses um, and if council wishes to discuss that um, I recommend that we put it on uh, for a future item on July the 2nd, um, so they can go back to planning through Mary Ann um, on the, uh, what would that be, the 9th. And the rest of it is just 
Or we can discuss it now, but I'm pretty sure you don't want to discuss it now. It wasn't in the hard packet, so I didn't yeah. I don't know how <laughs> I was sent those things. I mm. I was trying to make them copies in just, order that they were in the packet. I can't imagine why. And it wasn't so, working yeah. doing that. So on that topic, uh, Patty, you're asking us to decide whether we want Planning Commission to review that, right? No, Planning Commission has already reviewed this. Okay. And this is coming to you as a recommendation of Planning Commission that it go uh, into the code. So then we would be benefits. sending it. No, we would be. Who would be making that decision then? The uh, police department. The, yes, it would go with along with all the other parking offenses. Okay. Well, if you guys did not look at it yet, then we'll move that to uh, a later meeting. Um, so, Patty, one thing I wanted to say, I think it fits here, is, uh, you know, I think it's great that we're not requiring, you know, all staff to be here, you mm -hmm. know, without a reason at meetings, but. You know, in particular, we talked about the last meeting about the police report that we usually get monthly and that it wasn't in the last meeting packet. We thought it was going to be coming up like every month. Right. The one and that so, we right. And so this just made me think, you know, I want to make sure that we've got the planning and zoning thing. So just like what we've got in mayor's court that we've right. gotten every month and that ability to chart it. I want I don't want us to drop off of that okay so Sorry. planning and zoning PD mm -hmm. yeah the mayor's court is in there but the, the uh, planning and zoning and the PD are not yeah that's uh, very helpful to be able to track that okay Chris uh, if I've done that already thank you and you've tasked me with some things for the next meeting yeah good keep you busy all right and uh, all right board and commission reports any things that people would like to highlight or questions for fellow council members? Yeah, well, I'll just, from the Environmental Commission, we have uh, been talking about the Vernay ground pollution. Mm -hmm. And apparently this year, the EPA is going to uh, have a public process where there could be public input on uh, the plan that Vernay has. And we just feel that it's important that the village be involved in that. Now, whether that'll actually happen, well, it's been going on for over a decade, so. And I did email the um, contact at uh, the Envir uh, EPA in Chicago about having input into that, looking at the draft prior to, and I have not gotten an answer from her. Okay. Because I, I think that we've been going through this risk assessment process, looking at environmental issues, sort of like, what could we have an impact on? What are the risks? What could we do something about, you know? And it looks like one of the issues we want to focus on is groundwater pollution mm. issues. We may remediation. I wanted to point out that um, there's a couple things that will be coming back to council um, from the Justice System Task Force. The mayor's recommendation one, which uh, we discussed what a month ago um, will eventually be coming back don't know yet quite when that what that time frame will be but Lisa and I are going to be meeting with staff uh, looking at that uh, the input of staff in that recommendation and then uh, justice system task force also um, are doing a notice and comment on a community control of police surveillance uh, recommendation uh, that notice and comment will be posted in the newspaper this week um, and also will be posted in the, to the police department and uh, Patty's also aware of it uh, so we get input from the staff uh, before we finalize that recommendation. Um, and then the police work working group is just another item that uh, will eventually be coming to council. Um, had a draft report uh, regarding community police advisory boards. Um, it was discussed at our last meeting, and that will be uh, submitted to the council packet in the fall. I had a question. Uh, did the Library Commission discuss the uh, paving and, and, I guess, plumbing improvements that the village 
uh, paid for? Uh, well, we meet quarterly, uh -huh. um, and the last meeting, I think I was in the hospital, and I understood that it was a 10-minute meeting, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. The, the, not the much paving, happened. no. I mean, in, in what way? Are you talking about cost sharing or responsibility? or? I, I'm just curious about, I, I mean, I thought the Library Commission's main function was to discuss these infrastructure improvements yes. that they would like. So I guess, I just, that all happened, and I never heard about it. Um, at a council meeting until after the fact when you mentioned it at the last meeting and I saw it happen. Oh, so. you, you weren't aware that it had been mm -hmm. done. So I'm, I, I guess, yeah, my, my question is, I'm, I'm just wondering, is the Library Commission reviewing these proposals and? Well, the, um, actually the paving was just done as a, a general, you know, it's time to do the parking lot kind of thing. So that they weren't involved in that as far as the, um, like the HVAC is out when you say plumbing is out. Uh, we tied the, I don't know, Macy oh, Reynolds talked about the piping got fixed to, so that it's being drained. That or was something. just our crews digging it in properly, with the way it needed to be, the way it was supposed to have been before. Um, so that one, that was taken care of right now. What we're discussing is um, we finally got an answer from Greene County that we can have two unisex restrooms, one of which is handicapped and the other which is um, regular access. And so the library, um, the, the Green County Public Library is having plans drawn up for that construction, um, which will be discussed at the June, July, August meeting. Um, and that is, that would be something that probably comes to council to be in the 2019 budget. Okay. Well, I guess I think if we are paying for improvements that they should be, and we have a commission, they should be discussed and at least reported to council before the decision is made. Um, and then on notice and comment, Judith, when you guys, when you originally started talking about doing this, you had asked me about doing like a, um, whatchamacallit, uh, survey monkey. And I saw in your minutes, the disappointment about the feedback the last time, and I just wondered, are, have you guys thought about trying to, you know, do it so that it's more than just putting something in the paper to try to boost participation? Um, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I think I think it would be a good idea, um, and you know, we could set up that survey survey monkey thing. Maybe that's a way to get people to. To participate. Okay, Kevin, Lisa, anything special? Nothing. I, I realize I wish that I'd done this as an announcement. I should have got this at the top of the top of the night. But I, I want to point out for the John Bryan Community Gallery that the banners are going to come down and a new show is coming, and the name of the show is Remembering, and it will showcase 21 pieces from the permanent collection by artists who have passed away. Oh. And um, there's going to be a casual reception on Friday, July 6th from uh, 6 to 9 p.m. Okay. for the new show. There's other cool things going on, but that's really the one I think in the interest of time I want to mm -hmm. highlight. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I won't highlight anything special, but if you did not read my summary, I thought it was more provocative than usual. So I would suggest uh, take, giving it a review. Um, so uh, future agenda items. So I know we've talked about um, we're going to move JSTF uh, status to September. Um, we want to throw RVs in there. <laughs> Sounds funny. Come back with the stuff from the housing initiative, mm -hmm. the uh, vision statement, and also something about goals. You have the TLT yeah. request. Okay. And yep. then the water and sewer late fee ordinances. And you'll also have the tax budget. Okay. It has this emergency, just like every July. Oh, and village manager request. Uh, village manager, sir. Yeah. It's on there, right? Yeah. Okay. And we need the utility affordability proposal. That's specific to the Roundup program. Okay. 
Is that legislation, Patty? Which one? The utility roundup proposal? Or is that a is that a position paper? I think first we'll talk about it and then it'll is go it, to is a policy statement. Yeah, well then it okay. will right. Then we'll okay, need good. it. Okay. Anything else? All right. And I have been informed that we need to have a brief executive session for the purpose of potential litigation. So I'll entertain a motion. All right. I move. Okay. Don't, don't we have to be more explicit? Uh, no, that, that, I that's think that was good. it. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but we do need to do a roll call. So, Patty, if you do that. Uh, McQueen? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Here? Uh, Hensley? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Freer? Yes. House? Yes. Oh, whatever. 